Welcome to Roundtable Live for May 19th, 2017. I'm Bear Taffy, joined by Mathis Games, Rockley Smile, Northern Lion, and is that a little Tomo down there? Making an appearance. There he is. He yeah, doesn't buddy. want to be on camera very often, so it's very convenient that he's chosen this exact time and position. <laughs> we have been blessed oh. with the Tomo. And now he got his butt. Yeah. Is this one of those, you've been blessed with Tomo, retweet? Yeah. Have yeah a, buddy, a body for 100 years? That thing years. blew up, man. I won the bet. I feel good about that. <laughs> this freaking this Dan was like 400 retweets. Oh, no. No confidence. That's not a 400 retweet <laughs> no. tweet. It's Come got a on. cat in it. It's <laughs> got uh, shareability it's built in. It's got a in. call to action. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's you got all the, all the pieces of the puzzle, man. You figured it out. Well done. Uh, hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Sorry for missing last week. Apologize for that. Uh, Ryan and I were locked away uh, trying to solve the elaborate contraptions of the Kraken. That yes, was, it's correct. That was crazy. You're not kidding either. They really no, were that's, locked that's away. Legitimate. Mm -hmm. Is that the escape room thing you were talking yeah. about? Yeah. Escape room, yeah. Uh, Is a, we escaped from uh, almost all of it, but we were fooled by this stupid Yakuza puzzle where they gave us a bunch of song names, and then we had to... <laughs> accumulate the second letter of the band that sang all the songs and rearrange it into the password Ooh. opened up right. the freaking tesseract inside of which was a four digit <laughs> ma math problem which led to the code that opened the door straight up that I... that was like 20 puzzles deep too that thing was they told like you yeah. you mentioned this they told us after the fact that it was a, a room designed for 12 people that we were approaching yeah. with four so you know natural disadvantage there i was impressed no, no honestly way. like i was I was impressed with the uh, complexity of some of the things. I was doing a military crawl at some point, man. I yeah. had to really <laughs> get it, into it. So it had, it. like, secret compartments in other yeah. areas? Yeah. Oh, I was oh, inside okay. the wall mm -hmm. a couple times. Mm -hmm. Dang. Two, yeah, two separate occasions. One of the ones I did had a, it looked like a closet, and then when you got inside, it had a secret back wall, and then there's an entire other room oh, inside that's of that. awesome. That's I, so And cool. then inside of that was a locked plexiglass room with a coffin in it. Ooh. Like, that was awesome. Release the lich. Yes. That, that one cost an extra $15 because of the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun. I would be, like, straight up way too stupid, but... No, dude, it's... Much, no. It's They're just live-action Battlegrounds. Yeah. <laughs> just find the scopey, man. I wish we could do one, like, on the show. It's just they don't, like, you can't broadcast them or it ruins the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm hesitant to even go so far as to, you know, divulge the little details we did yeah. today about it because we're ruining the secrets, man, of the Ninja Escape, which, by the way, I do recommend that place if you're in the Seattle area. It was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, anyway, we got a show to do today. Got a lot of stuff to talk about. It's been a little while. Uh, first of all, Throwing this on the top of the docket before uh, Moobot even was aware of it. Destiny 2 got a lot of info dumped uh, yesterday. We're going to be talking about that briefly here at the start of the show. Uh, Ubisoft doing Ubisoft things. Unsurprising news there to touch on a little bit. Square Enix and IO Interactive part ways. A little bit of sad news there for the Hitman developers. We'll talk about what that means for the future of that franchise and Square Enix as well. Uh, the Witcher is getting a Netflix series, which is Kind of fucking sweet, honestly, I'm if you ask me. It. Yeah, Bring that's that's a pretty cool <laughs> idea. I'm uh, fucking apathetic. Yeah! <laughs> Just like Geralt. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Good point. Uh, the Stream Deck, the Elgato Stream Deck. We talked about this as it uh, was announced, but now we have a member of the crew that actually has experience with one hands on. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit today, too. Uh, then we're getting into the games. We got quite a few this week. We got Strafe. Uh, we got NBA Playgrounds, we got Tethered VR, that's Bears VR Corner, the patented new segment here on Roundtable. Quake Champions, that is, that's the beta, right, currently, or maybe yes. it is right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Open, we, closed beta, whatever that means. Yeah. What does that mean, actually? It means the, anyone can get a code, but they don't just give them out, you gotta go get it yourself. Okay, okay. <laughs> so they make you work for it, right. Uh, another beta we'll be talking about briefly, uh, Sundered, as well as the new one from the makers of Yotun. And then the one that we're all loving for the last couple of weeks, it's Dead Cells. We'll talk about that at the uh, tail end of the show. Getting back to the big stuff, though, from yesterday is Destiny 2. Uh, we heard quite a bit about the upcoming release. It's going to be slated for, I believe, September, right? Although the big news, of course, uh, is that the PC release date will not be the same day. And that makes me sad. Yeah, it was it was loaded up with like a bunch of great stuff. Uh, everybody that's played it said the PC version like looked miles better than the console. It's like uncapped frame rate, high resolution. Yeah, all this stuff. Um, and then they're like, oh, by the way, not right away. So I was like, ah, uh oh. <laughs> they, did anybody like, else have this weird reaction where I read the headline? I was like, it's coming out on Battle.net. 
That's mm. crazy. And then so, I remembered that yep. Activision <laughs> exactly. and Blizzard are the same company. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh, it makes yeah. a ton of sense. That was actually. the exact train of thought I had. It took me about a minute and a half before I thought, you know what, that, that's what I should have expected yeah. in the first place. <laughs> They're publishing third-party games now? Excuse yeah. me? <laughs> it's like a real shot across the bow for Steam yeah. until I thought about it for five seconds. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, so that's the other big uh, scoop from yesterday as well, is that Destiny 2 will be available on Battle.net or the Blizzard app or whatever the fuck they're calling it these days. Honestly, who knows? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's called the Blizzard app, which is dumb. It's called Battle.net. They called it Battle.net during the fucking announcement. Like, the CEO of Blizzard oh, really? called it Battle.net. I was like, what the fuck, man? You, of course, have it, right? I mean, they've through... been at it for like 25 years now. Yeah, like, you go through that whole time. Trying or not like the whole endeavor of renaming the thing when Lord knows probably nobody asked for that, but eh, I guess they're going back on it now. Not that that really means anything to anyone, but uh, yeah, but Destiny 2, it's uh, it's got a hype train, man. 400,000 live viewers for the announcement wow. stream was uh, pretty That's ridiculous. Crazy. Yeah, the, the fact that it's hitting PC I'll, it means I'll immediately at least try it and hope that it's uh, it hooks me. Yeah. Um, I hope it's from what I know of Destiny One. I hope it's more gamey than Destiny One is. Um, I hope it's more open as well. I mm. want a more open world as opposed to you know just little segments that you go what, to. And, and what does more gamey mean in that context? Yeah, you more gotta... of a more of a story focus, I guess, because I hear Destiny's one story kind of just was like mm, gives a shit. You're just gonna go and do yeah, it's, it's raids. It's like here's a big long yeah. corridor, and you get your friends together and you blast. Borderlands monster. No, I was say, it just sounds like Borderlands, which I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I got sick of Borderlands after the first one, kind of the second one, so I don't really mm -hmm. want a more serious take on Borderlands. I want something a little different. I'm kind of with you there. I like the idea of making it more open. I think the uh, addition of four more planets will certainly help that out. Like, uh, mm -hmm. if I recall correctly, Destiny originally only really had, I think, maybe only four, maybe five places that you could go total, like planets or even just like space structures that you could really access. So that'll probably open it up quite a bit. There was another feature I was actually really excited for too that they announced yesterday, uh, the guided games, which was definitely something that I would have loved to have in Destiny 1 because I played most of Destiny 1 by myself mm -hmm. uh, and that way I couldn't really access a lot of the end game content, a lot of the really cool raids that you need to have a full squad of six, I think it is for. And uh, with this, with the guided games plus the inclusion of now the new clan system built into Destiny 2, they're going to allow you to sort of like be sherpa through those high-level uh, quests. So, you know, you can't really find five of your friends to do one of those late-level raids with. You can sort of queue up into this guided games matchmaking and uh, be matched up with a few different teams who are looking for one more recruit to take into those high or, uh, lower level or later level areas, which is <clears> neat. <throat> I like that idea quite a bit. It's like an actual MMO. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it'll be interesting to see if you like queue as a class or if you just if you're thrown into like the general population. If you can queue and be like, I'm a ranger looking for a party, or like we're a party looking for a ranger or something. Yeah, and then then it just becomes wow at that point, I suppose. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I, I, I'm curious to see uh, more of how the clans will actually be involved. Kate. Hi, Kate. Kate. Oh, oh, shit! Okay. Well done. Big pimpin'. Well done. That's official, right? When, once you get the t-shirt, that means it's real. Does that mean you can be hired by any game studio now? That's the only... That's what you need? It's effectively worth nothing. <laughs> to be honest with you. But, uh... It's, it's at least an indicator of base competency in the software. For those, uh, for those tuning in audio only, <laughs> Ryan just got his certified Unity developer t-shirt in the, in the uh, yeah. post of today, I guess. Yeah, that's for the dude... Hat? It's for the dude who thought I freaking made it up. Took a picture of somebody uh, else's certification like tag. He flew all the way to Seattle just for he flew, yeah. And giggles. Because you went on vacation and had to come up with an alibi. That's exactly. why you're yeah, yeah. somebody exactly. else's. What's your alibi when you go to Japan then? Uh, if I don't leave, I'm gonna delete my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it. You're gonna go insane. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Yeah, we don't need to talk about Destiny too much more now. But suffice to say, I mean, let's go down the list. Mm -hmm. Kind of excited. Wish it came to PC at the same time that it came to consoles. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like I can almost see it happening already. Like, if it comes out on consoles in like September, and then it comes out on PC like the next June, 
I'm going to find it pretty hard to care about it. Yeah, me too. I'll be like, mm, well, yeah, I mean, then right. again, it could turn into another GTA five situation. I think this might be a big enough property to, you know, be able to stretch it out over that long of a period of time, especially a game like this that has that longevity just, you know, to begin with. You're not wrong, but I kind of feel like I'll, the, the community will have left me behind at that point. Like I'm going in with yeah. a huge disadvantage. If not only did I barely play the first game, but like the second game has been out on another platform for like eight months. But if it comes out soon enough, I don't know. This, this strikes me as one of those situations where I'm going to, if I don't play it at launch, I'm going to wait eight years for it to be free and then <laughs> be real with microtransactions and then I'll play it. Yeah. Did we get a vibe on why it's delayed for PC? Is it so they can sort of give it that air of console exclusivity? I'm sure there's money involved. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't give you an honest reason for it. Uh, Cause we're, we're bending over backwards to give consoles a reason to even exist at this point. <laughs> so like, I mean, we are yo, but Mario Kart eight deluxe is the greatest game. Maybe Nintendo's ever made. Isn't it just eight better? Yeah. Well, it's eight you, with, you I think, it, what, right? a couple additional tracks, uh, 200 CC, 200 and a couple CC. new characters. Mm -hmm. it's, and battle mode. It has battle mode now, too. The most beautiful creation in video game history. Eight is just wonderful. It didn't really need I the I loved deluxe eight on the Wii U. Yeah. Like, I played the shit out of eight, so. Yeah. Anyway. I bought it. I think I played it once. Yo, yeah. it's really good. It is really good. Or investment yeah. on my part, to be honest. Pretty terrific. We still play it. Uh, anyway. There we go. Guess Destiny Two. We uh, all the other part of the uh, PC release is that they uh, also have made the decision not to have dedicated servers again, which kind of sucks. What really? Yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. I I mean I don't know. I, I imagine again that's probably a thing where like their architecture is so based on the idea of having P two P servers that it would be more trouble than it's worth. But it sucks because like you just watched For Honor get crapped on exactly. for the exact yeah. same thing like three months ago mm -hmm. i mean that's not the only thing wrong with for honor obviously but you know that's one of the things that was most ridiculed about it and then you're like well i guess we'll just you just choose to take that one on the chin mm -hmm. did you see the for honor not to go on a tangent but the for honor like tournament that just happened last i week? did not oh yeah uh, uh it's hilarious <laughs> so what they did is they got like four pros and four streamers. Okay. And they didn't tell the streamers that there were going to be pros. <laughs> oh. Uh, and they That's put, so good. <laughs> they put two pros and two streamers on two different teams. Yeah. And then the top two from each team would go to the finals. <laughs> so what ended up happening was because and because it was like a promotion thing, the streamers got knocked out almost immediately, but they had to like tweet and host it. So they got like the audience of the streamers. Oh man. And then so only had so pros shady. playing at the end. So it shady, was, uh, man. yeah, it was like they, <laughs> the people I were talking to, like they didn't fucking tell us. <laughs> they didn't yeah. tell us the pros were coming. They just said it was a streamer thing. Like they oh, should have done a double amazing. swap and made the made the pros have to play Disney Crossy Road at the very end. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I don't know why they just didn't put the streamers and the pros on two separate teams. Sure, the pros would whoop them, but at least you're gonna have two streamers in the end. And oh two no, pros yeah, like end. that's that's the writing on the wall right there. Is like, is very explicitly designed that way, right? Or at least yeah. it certainly seems that like that. It's so good. That yeah. when I heard, it, I laughed. So that was great. Yeah, that's really funny. Hey, I hope I didn't go too hard on the skepticism on Destiny. I'm like just, I'm like okay with it either way. I just, I, I hate the whole thing like about how we've got to justify consoles now. That's all. But I'll play it. I'm, I like the first one a little bit. It was okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking of For Honor, though, I want to get that segue in there before we lost it. Ubisoft. Straight up just being Ubisoft. Just just guess, chat. <laughs> Three games coming up this year from Ubisoft. <laughs> Straight up, just tell me what they are. You know. Three games, you have four choices. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yeah. <laughs> As an aside, while they're guessing, if this isn't just a rhetorical bit, yeah, yeah. you see that uh, the data, Damon Hetfield of, uh, it's probably not how you pronounce either of his names, <laughs> yeah, but uh, from IGN tweeted that like the biggest selling game of 2017 so far is actually Ghost Recon Wildlands. Wow. What? Yeah. And then Why? Oh, God. number wow. two. They fooled them. I, I think number two was For Honor. And then number no three was Breath of the Wild. Oh my God! Fuck! Bamboozled. It's crazy. Swindled. Yeah, very strangely in a bubble vision of what the industry is, don't we? Yeah, we really do. 
<laughs> I mean, Man. we we were all still in the mindset where we could acknowledge that Call of Duty was still topping the charts every year, but now we're just not even. We don't have our fingers on anyone's pulse. Not just not the pulse of the nation. We don't got yeah. fingers we're on. We're a anything. bunch of corpses floating down the river yeah. at this point. We I mean, I can almost see For Honor. Like, I really hope For Honor gets a sequel that does it right because I like the mechanics of For Honor, as I've said a thousand times. The game that it was packaged with is just not good. But Ghost Recon Wildlands, that that confuses. Me. I remember this is only in the U.S. as well. I should be okay. Yeah, okay. that's to make sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I remember. I remember going back from the Wildlands event, being like, "Guys, this is a lot of fun. We should play this." And then I was met it. with the wall of cynicism from this <laughs> lot here. Just well, no fun quickly, whatsoever. Within an hour, I'm very like, well, good. you're just going to do the same thing for the rest of the game. Got like a 70 meta score or something. Like. Yeah, no, I honestly, I, I won't even really argue for its quality anymore because you guys have made some valid points about it. But it is very surprising to hear that it's top in the charts. That's why. It was gorgeous. Okay. Yeah, it's really pretty. For what it's worth, like the number seven best selling game in the US in 22017 is Grand Theft Auto V. So, mm. well, so uh, game will always be good. What about number four and five? <laughs> <laughs> Horizon Zero Dawn and Mass Effect Andromeda. Okay. And those don't surprise me. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then, they, you know, there's like NBA 2K17, MLB, which I assume is MLB The Show, yeah. mm-hmm. and November's Call of Duty. And Damn, Resident dude. Evil 7, number six. Damn, hey, dude. you know, that's, that's good. I'm glad. They did yeah, a good that, job. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, I agree with you. Neat. Uh, well, anyway, if you haven't guessed already, Ubisoft announced Far Cry 5, The Crew right. 2, and the Crew. Assassin's Creed something. No, 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 yeah. Like rumor, it's going to be called Assassin's Creed. I'm not kidding. Assassin's Creed Origins. Wait, I couldn't tell you if that game already exists or not. I couldn't either. I really like. <laughs> it might. <laughs> I, there's genuinely like a 40 percent chance it already exists. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Assassin's Creed prequels are called Assassin's Creed Chronicles. Okay. Yeah, not right, Assassin's Creed right. Origins. Mm-hmm. It's two completely different things. There's like Brotherhood, Unity, and then like three other ones with single words You're that right. I can't. Yeah, words. <laughs> Assassin's That's Creed. That's what I mean. Origin. Like I can't tell you if it's real or. Okay. No, Assassin's here's the, here's Creed the, Origin the, on Unity. Powered up by Steam. Here's the list of words that have followed colons in the Assassin's Creed series. Uh, Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Revelations. Black Flag. Uh, Unity. Rogue. Unity. Syndicate. Liberation. Syndicate. Chronicles. Bloodlines. Discovery. Recollection. Pirates. Recollection? I've never heard of that one. <laughs> What's Recollection? Is that a mobile one? Oh, apparently, okay, some of these are canceled, I guess. All right, so I shouldn't include oh, well. a lot of these ones, but... Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite the list. <laughs> <laughs> Remember this uh, when we got excited over Game of Thrones getting like five announced potential spinoffs? Yeah. Just get in there. you know. Oh, make, did it really? Get, got five well, spinoffs? Well, they're working like, on them. Shit. Not, like somewhere between zero and two of That's them. That's HBO whatever, actually, just being yes, like, but... we can't lose the game of thrones money when the series yeah. ends yeah just like saturate the shit out of it <laughs> mm-hmm. and then wait a year when the backlash hits and then yeah. just sequelize them again all That's... right before we dig ourselves too deep into this hate hole right <laughs> let's start with crew two because that actually strikes me as not a move that i expected them to make yeah that same. was like, the that... crew was the car game with That's... towers yeah, yeah it's the full country of the united states except it's like shrunk down by like 95 percent Okay. Game where you uh, tra- I still think of the fucking car game with towers is you're driving a car carefully up these metal steps <laughs> on this <laughs> big tower. You're just going from platform to platform. Well, no, they made the Forza Horizons Hot Wheels uh, crossover, which actually is kind of that. Oh, God. And it actually looks pretty badass. Yeah. I would play that. All right. Uh, uh, but do you know what do you know about Crew? I don't know much about the Crew 2. Honestly, they haven't really revealed a lot of details about either Far Cry 5 or the Crew 2. I know about the Crew. I got a physical version of the Crew, wow. actually, if oh, you can believe wow. it. Yeah, they For sent the me Xbox the, One? No, they, the PC. They sent me a what? PC Whoa. disc. Shit. If you can wow. believe it. They sent you a disc? I'd be like, I can't. I don't actually have no, a CD drive. Right. I don't have one in my <laughs> other computer. I've got one in the first one, but not in the second one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, I I didn't play much of the crew to be honest with you. I didn't really ever get into it, but uh, I I am also pretty much equally surprised by that announcement of the crew too. I didn't I didn't see that one coming at all. But 
Bear and I are the original crew. If any of you have been following us long enough, you know that we have a history of driving or riding around entire land masses. Yeah. So the crew is basically the perfect game for us to do that again with. Yeah, we probably I'm should. I hope crew two is awesome. We're going to drive. Yeah, hopefully. That'd be dope. We should do that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So there we go. Here's the Ubisoft news for you. Hey, is it refreshing that me usually being pro-corporate I'm actually like super cynical about this because how could we care? <laughs> well, like the spinoff for Far Cry. Maybe there's a new idea. The thing with Far Cry is like I played four and uh, well, I didn't play um, Primal. You didn't play Primal? No, but I played three and four. Okay. I, I thought four, I was like, this is good. And it's got some okay ideas, but... They got to, like, really impress me with Far Cry 5. Yeah, I remember saying on the podcast before it came out, I'm like, it's just three again. Yeah. And you guys are like, well, it's still good. I I'm still like, disagree with that, though. I, I do. I, I disagree with the notion it's, that it's just three. It's again. cool, but I need more than, like, you know, the fire Festival gone wrong and uh -huh. then go around with your bow and arrow. And then the, the villain is, like, really charismatic. Like, that's that's Far Cry to me right now. <laughs> it's is like haircut. a bow and arrow, and you can, like, <laughs> drive and fly and then the villain is carried and you had a wingsuit in the fourth one right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all we need yeah. is just like just some bonkers ass new vehicle that's it because that's the final piece of the puzzle you didn't you didn't include that in your listing ryan but that I is did. like and like hunting things to make a wallet but what if true. they go and i think i've even said this on a prior episode but what if they go like the saints row route and you go to hell and it's like far cry in the spectral realm it's plausible that could. Uh, I would love that. that. Do it. Once you get to that point, though, there's no coming back. It's like when you get to Far Cry Six You're after right. that, where are you gonna go? You can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what if it's we'll Far happens. Cry in like thirty one twenty seven? See, that could be cool, like a, a full on blood dragon. Like, yeah. Well, then it can't be an island where you're in the wilderness, and Far Cry is all about being on an island That's in the true. wilderness. And then at the end, you sit yourself in a machine. And then it puts you into Assassin's Creed. <laughs> it's that Far Cry, it. <laughs> but it's Star Wars. And Far, Far Wars. you're in an X-Wing, and you have to hunt down uh, Voss because he's come back. He's undead. He's oh, a zombie. Okay. Oh, shit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Snoke. He's Snoke. Snoke. Oh, I like that word. I just like to repeat it. Yeah, it's fun. I like Far Cry, even I though do. it's I really do like lame. I still it's like not it. a bad game at all. It's fun to play. <laughs> at the same time, I'd like Far Cry. It feels like it's been a while since there's been a Far Cry, but since 2012, there's been Far Cry 3, Blood Dragon, 4, and Primal. Yeah. That's four Far Cry games in five years. Mm -hmm. It feels but like it hasn't been a while. It's been a while because I didn't play Primal, I think. Then freaking Assassin's Creed. <laughs> it's been like over a year since the last Assassin's Creed, but that still puts us at like 3.2 Assassin's like, Creeds per year since 2000. <laughs> and I'm honestly awful? like certain that the only reason we didn't get an Assassin's Creed last year was because they know the customer base is burnt down on it for yeah. Well, yeah, Syndicate multiple did not releases well. per year. Yeah, it's like, okay, we can't put out this many, so we have to dial it back, and now it's coming right back. Now they've got six of them in the freaking warehouse ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> no. I can measure I can measure when I bought my video card by what Assassin's Creed came out. <laughs> oh, you're right. They do one for every generation. <laughs> it's like, how old is my video card? Well, I got Syndicate with it for free. Mm -hmm. So it's like two years old, all right? Yeah, I'm still doing all right. <laughs> I like I like that Nick the idea that they're just edging themselves with these Assassin's Creed releases, <laughs> yeah. just just waiting. They're That's gonna so get many one for way you. or the other. It's just whether or not they let them out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh boy. We'll see. I'm, uh, I'm, I, I you know skeptical as usual, but still interested in Far Cry as always. Yeah, it's just no. Like I'm I'm just, I'm 100 percent with you here, Ryan. Though just because this headline reads like a fucking joke, it's like. Yeah. <laughs> Of course they would announce that. Like, what it's like an onion headline or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. I just, like, I can't get excited. E even if it came out and people were like, Far Cry 5 is a is a 9.9 .9 out of 10. I just kind of like... Well, it won't be. I mean, but it, like, also, who cares? <laughs> like, you know, they need to... I mean, we're old and hipsters and, like, we don't necessarily feel the compulsion to buy the new... Assassin's Creed for any reason, I guess. But, like, announce a new IP or now, something. What's the last one they did, though? It's probably Steam, For right? Honor, I guess. Or For like, Honor 2, yeah, I guess that makes like, sense. For Honor is 
is a cool idea. I don't want them to announce a four on or two like three months after the first one came out necessarily. But oh God, that would be that would be. And a they're doing good idea. stuff. Here's I, I understand Ubisoft has a problem as well because they're doing a great job supporting Rainbow Six Siege, but that's not something they can annualize now because they've like, committed to the Rainbow Six Siege as a platform sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So they yeah. can't say like they have a problem. It's like they just can't stop drinking. <laughs> I honestly, my my mind went the same way, Nick. Except it was like they just can't stop franchising. Yeah, you know? <laughs> just, we're they're addicted to it. Sequel after sequel. And but yeah, you're mean, right. You're right with the Rainbow Six thing. There, it's what are they going to do now? Rainbow Six, and sequels. they're doing the same thing with For Honor. Like, they're this is season two of For Honor that's coming up. So it yeah. seems like they're which is great, and it's what we asked for. They just introduced like Romans game. and a whole set of new fighters, and exactly just take the game, make it better and treat it as if like it's something that you can grow sort of organically for a couple of years at the very least but like but then what do you do because they don't have anything else they can announce a new splinter cell but like blacklist was amazing and everybody hates it and you're all wrong and then <laughs> i don't understand why everybody hates it i liked it a lot so you get a gun who even actually hates it here nobody there hates were, it. in 2013 we were just wrote not as off. excited as you but nobody hated People it People wrote off blacklist because there's like an assault rifle in it at one point <laughs> I didn't like, even this isn't my Blacklist. splinters. Blacklist is so good, Bear. It's <laughs> just like people <laughs> saying Absolution isn't my hitman. Right. Thing. But Absolution is not as good, and Blacklist is a masterpiece. All right. <laughs> That's where we want to leave the Ubisoft conversation, for sure. Make Blacklist Splinter Cell it. Blacklist too. <laughs> but, like, call it... Whitelist. Yeah. Call Whitelist. Whoa, okay, well... <laughs> Square Enix has decided to withdraw from IO Interactive. I'm not da- surprised. Danish studio behind the Hitman franchise, and it's probably pretty easy to discern why. It's uh, what I said right when the game came out. Episodic release is going to kill this game. But yeah. these, it's the, this is the perfect example of like no good deed goes unpunished in like the video game universe. Because IO took like a huge risk on this episodic release and nobody believed in them, including every single one of us, I think. And all good, I mean, you can go back every yeah. week and we were like, Hitman, no, you're right. who cares? No, hey. Just I, give us all the games at the same time. I, I will not allow you to lump me in with that, dude. Okay. I was an early supporter. I was trying to get y'all on board way back in the day when episode one came around. I'm gonna, I'm gonna it's, stand up for myself. The, the issue there. wasn't, like I said, when it came out, the issue wasn't that the game was bad because the game was excellent. The yeah. gameplay was great. Yeah. But when you do something episodic like that, all the hype is burned out on episode one and then it's done. Nobody gives a shit anymore. And the story for a Hitman at the very least, not that I play Hitman for the story, but the hit, the story in Hitman was worse than any of the other stories from all the other Hitman. Jeez, I don't know. Like, it's, <laughs> it's really bad. I'll get, and it's probably my favorite game of last year. But the story in, in Hitman, all caps, is really bad. But the story in Absolution is also pretty Chad's saying. I'm not saying the story was in absolution was good. Fucking nuns with machine guns. Like, like the luchador section. And... You can tell me I'm wrong all I want, chat, but the, the game only sold 400,000 copies. Like, it you don't did even not go sell. that far, though. Square Enix is the same freaking group that says Tomb Raider was unsuccessful. Yeah. True. Right? Like, they just have a really weird uh, but, metric for success. They have a high only standard. Sold, but yeah. it only sold 400,000 copies. Even in the indie game world, that's garbage. That's not it's garbage not in good. any game world. What, but that is... what, do they, what do they mean they sold? Because this is a weird pay model. So, like, do they mean they sold complete editions or do they mean they That's sold a good question. episodic yeah, versions? Because like, I don't... It in does in the matter. best case scenario, it's 400,000 full copies, right? Which still, right. like, even in that circumstance is not meeting any criteria for any AAA developer. It had, like, a super weird... I, Mathis, I think, is right. It it got a really awesome long tail. Like, people are talking, it, maybe around, like, December, people were talking about Hitman more than it's ever been talked about. And the first episode came out in, like, April or something like that, or May. So I think when, it, when the first episode came out, people were like, eh, you know, I'll just wait for the whole thing. It didn't really get that much buzz. And by the time it sort of finished, done... Too late. Yeah. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. But like the episodic model, they made me a believer in it in Hitman. But I I mean it's a super bummer for IO Interactive and I think also for 
I don't want to say consumers because I mean that you, you can vote with your wallets obviously but like I really think that experiment panned out it sucks that um, you know this is the consequence of it chat chat you have to understand like with the episodic model for us and like the gaming enthusiasts episodic is great because it keeps you coming back but whatever but for the general public which is the people who are gonna walk into a store and buy a game and go home most people are gonna get excited for the launch on day one and then in a week they're done and they're on to the next game that's the that's how the hype cycle fucking works. That's how this injury industry has built this this cycle. Mm-hmm. So what once once episode one is done out done, it's a forty five minute experience for most people. And then the next episode doesn't come out for another month. Most people are like, I'm done with the game. They don't care anymore. For us, people who are, are like in the industry and give us a reason to come back and play over and over again, it's great. But the general public doesn't give a shit. I think a lot of people might have like seen a bit of a gold rush back when telltale kind of made episodic a thing again and maybe saw a little bit of uh, a glimmer there that they could capitalize on but i don't know i don't think it really it it, it might be you know it's a, it's a culmination of a few issues i'm sure but I don't, I don't know if just the episodic uh system is is good for anything that isn't hyper focused on narrative you know like i think that's what telltale works for telltale because- games it, because they're niche, they don't. They're not trying to hit this blockbuster well, that's true thing too. that yeah. Square Enix is yeah. trying to do. You can't compare them. And like Final Fantasy VII is going to be episodic, which worries me. But I think also Final Fantasy VII is is. I mean, JRPG fans are JRPG fans. They're not, you know, your your typical consumer. Mm-hmm. But JRPGs um, are like they they are heavily narrative focused. So I think it could work for that too. You know, yeah, like, I think, yeah, sure. I think it I being. Think so too. I think that that's like the the quintessential reason why episodes work is because they have to have uh con- like people have to be drawn to the story to want to come back. That right. if you're going to sell something in episodes or sell something in seasons or sell something in just blocks of content, you're going to you're going to like introduce a whole bunch of shit that people are interested in and then leave it on a cliffhanger or just on an interesting point that they want to see the resolution to at the end. I, I agree with you and disagree with you with respect to Hitman specifically. I think that because this is like the eighth game or whatever in the Hitman franchise, people have the preconceived notion, probably rightly, that it's a game you just play through. And then the Hitman, I don't think it did it, the Hitman 2016, I don't think it did a great job of selling people on the idea that it's not like a playthrough once and then drop it game. Like it's actually at the risk of being a caricature of myself, it's close to a roguelite, especially when they introduce yeah, things like yeah. the escalations where you got to like beat these missions in five yeah. different ways, like getting harder and harder. And especially yeah. the elusive targets where, you know, that's like a, a monthly challenge where they're like, kill this guy and like use this weapon on this map and then like go for it um, and get the highest score that you can. Instead, you kind of like, I, I, at least I was like this before I, played it myself all the way through i was like i sort of don't get it like it feels like i would just wait and then beat all six missions in a day and then be done with the game instead of having to maintain like a thread of being invested and every three months drop back into it yeah that's fair no and i I, I, there's multiple considerations as i mentioned too i just i i do wonder if that is you know i don't know if you guys can hear that sorry sirens going on i don't know if that is enough though you know like to really pushing and i guess it wasn't i wonder if i wonder who who decided it was going to be episodic io or square enix it sounds like it might have been an io thing because they had a second season planned as well that they never officially announced so it it, it might have just been their director from the start but uh that being said like it still would be better i think if it just came out all at once yeah i agree I, if it came out with all six missions and then they were like, hey, once every two weeks, there's going to be like a, a, an elusive target. And then we'll yeah, like keep cool. releasing like featured mm-hmm. contracts and stuff like that. And then the DLC can be episodic, you know, once every two or three months, mm-hmm. release one new mission. That's probably unrealistically fast, but like that makes sense. But I don't know. Like I, it almost feels like that is a financial decision. Like maybe they needed some of the money or wanted some of the money to fund later development. But, uh, yeah. I mean, this is all spitballing, to be honest. The uh, Well, they did, like, the 
not only they did the episodic releases, but while those were coming out, they had like the specialty elusive targets as well, right? That were sort of meant as a promotional thing, which yeah. I think you're, I agree that they should have just done that with the full release. And I really think that would have been a lot more effective. The, the, the um, I'm sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. I'm reading this thing here too. <laughs> no, I, to, to take that episodic thing, I, I'm curious how much, uh, how negative it was for them sales-wise right out the gate. Because remember, there were rumors that were being reported that Deus Ex was also supposed to be initially episodic. Oh, really? And then after Hitman came out, that like there was rumors that they were scrambling to make to put the episode like to not make it episodic and make it one cohesive game. So I wonder if just the launch immediately was just like a, a disappointment. Yeah. If I remember, there was like a dev blog that was talking about how they did the entire development cycle for Deus Ex as if it was not planning to be episodic, and then they dropped it on them in the last few months, and they had to start Possibly. pulling stuff out of it so they could like reorganize it back into a better structure. Hmm. And that, if that is the way that actually went, that tells me that this is more of a, a PR play than it is actually them caring about the quality of the game that they see this as a sort of a trendy way to encapsulate uh, this concept. And this is something that's traditionally associated with the way TV uh, is sent to people. And something that I think you can't really escape from that concept is that people expecting something presented like a TV show are expe expecting a very highly uh, narrative oriented experience. Once you yeah. start getting into a very heavily gameplay oriented experience and it drops off like that, it just doesn't have the same framing that leaves you with that satisfied, like, oh, I just can't wait to get back. Yeah. It leaves you with this, I'm frustrated, I can't keep playing the game I bought feeling, which is, it's, there are dissonant concepts. It only works for Telltale because they dovetail so nicely into the next episode. I mean, and uh, Telltale round. games are minimal gameplay, mostly just a movie. I still think Hitman works epic, episodically and is not narrative driven, but I also agree that I don't think IO did a good job of selling okay. that yeah like i feel like an, a better structure and again w like in the end what do we know but i feel like a better structure having played like 80 hours of hitman 2016 is you come out with like the canonical story missions whenever i don't really care if it's episodic or it's all at launch and then you have like a button that takes the same level because those levels are like very tightly designed and they've got all sorts of tools and cool like takedowns that you can use and you just press the button and it does the Hitman Roulette thing for you. It goes like, this is who you're killing and it marks them on your map. And this is what you have to kill them with. And this is what you have to like escape it. Like almost straight up like a like an Isaac style that would, random yeah, run. Yeah. That'd be and cool. then it accomplishes, I hope, and this is probably a little bit like we're a little too savvy. And I don't mean that as tooting our own yeah, horn, but like yeah, we're, we're on the inside of already like oh, yeah. most of us liking this game so it's hard to harder to sell to a general audience i guess but like i think that does a second job of also advertising to people that this is not something to just be played once it's actually an engine for you like a sandbox to mess around with yeah yeah i agree i think that would have been a better way to do it it could like this could have been another games as games as a service platform like for honor or like uh, sieges now. I think they wanted it to be. They just wanted it to be through the idea of it being episodic, mm -hmm. which d those ideas don't all roll together nicely because there's so many expectations that come with the one. Right. Yeah. Well, sadly, we won't be uh, seeing the continuation, at least from IO themselves, of Hitman. So now it sounds like Square has Square has preserved the Hitman franchise they still own it or as i far don't as I can know tell. actually i thought they could shop around for a different publisher from what i read currently in negotiations to secure this inv i'm not 100 percent sure on the it. way i understand it square enix owns io interactive they mm -hmm. uh are well i mean they basically issued a warning to their shareholders they're like you're not gonna like the earnings statement because we are <laughs> writing off like this incredible loss for yeah. running io interactive because hitman didn't bring in the revenue we expected but I think IO Interactive might own the Hitman trademark because they were making Hitman games before Square Enix bought them. They made Absolution, right? They made all of them, I thought. Yeah. Did they? Yeah, I think IO's been involved in all of them. I don't know. 
Who made? It's funny. You go, their website right now says we're hiring. So I don't know. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. we're hiring a new webmaster oh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> so since yeah, they, they, they've done all the hitmans. They did all. Okay, I didn't realize it was all. Or at all the least hands. all all the main main, main hitmans. Sure. Hitman, hitmans. Hitman. <laughs> the main hitmans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so anyway that's a shame condolences to the so IO the, folks the message underlying this is like what don't end up caught up with Square because they won't be satisfied with anything you make <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, not joking they didn't know. sell that well yeah. to be honest <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a few facts it's a critical darling for sure but yep. you know it's I guess it's tough to sell to a, to a general audience Big competition, man. Okay. Hey, The Witcher. It's getting a Netflix series. That's, that's pretty dope. It's another critical darling I've heard. Yeah. It's a... Witcher, uh, greatest game of 2017. <laughs> game of the year 2017. Game of the year. <laughs> I think The Witcher television show is going to be garbage. Really? Yes. Oh, Why? shit. Because I, I just... Don't believe in it at all. Not conceptually, but the the article I read, and I don't want to be insulting here, but it's not like, you know, this is David Cronenberg making The Witcher or something like that. They're like, a Polish production company is handling the creation of The Witcher. And I'm like, okay, it's not, it's not necessarily bad, but also the fact that I've never heard of them or anything they've done mm -hmm. kind of intimidates me the oscar-nominated visual effects studio platige image sa is doing the show yeah <laughs> <laughs> we don't know maybe they're i don't know yeah cool. well let me look them up here platige. i think the primary concern here is who's playing Geralt. no this matters not doesn't matter it matters who's making <laughs> the show <laughs> netflix isn't making the show they're just publishing the show that's true they made cinematics for Total War Warhammer 2. That's pretty sweet. Well, the T's did? Yeah. yeah. They made the making of for Watch Dogs 2. They did some Ooh. cinematics in Ghost Recon Wildlands. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, current. you know what? They helped make King's Glaive, the there Final Fantasy 15 movie. There you go. They did uh, cinematics in The Wild Hunt. I don't know if you already said that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And cinematics for Prey. Yeah. They've, they've done a lot of video game cinematics and then also commercials. So Seems this like is fit. why this is why I'm cautiously pessimistic. Is not that to be even rude. a phrase? <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost optimistic, but I just can't be. <laughs> I, I'm with you though. I hope it's gonna be. I, I'm, I hope it's gonna be good, but I won't. I won't cross my fingers for it. Who's gonna be Geralt though? Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, they will not be able to afford Mads Mikkelsen. <laughs> Michael Fassbender. This is zero chance. You want me to read off the things that the studio has done before? <laughs> what you're looking for here is like a dude who played like the second in command on Spartacus or something. And this, if it succeeds, will be his breakout role. One of those Black Mirror actors that hasn't gotten a better offer yeah. yet. Yeah, and then Yennefer shows up for one episode and it's like Eliza Dushku or something. Like, who the fuck is Eliza Dushku? Um, she Whoa, was... Damn the lead in dollhouse and uh river she, tam in the firefly there she, you go. oh she was no, faith on buffy kidding. the vampire slayer in its yeah, spin-off series angel i'm way wrong on the on yeah the you're firefly dead wrong girl who was river tam i can't remember her name no i think I this is gonna know. be great man next game of thrones easy easy honestly though like playing the witcher 3 i get game Something of thrones like vibes from it is. when you encountered some situations don't you, you can, not it's like it's, I, it's, it's it's way more fantastical. Yes, than Game yes, of that's true. Like, incredibly more fantastical. Mm -hmm. so, so you don't think that will translate well? Yeah, they need a good budget. Yeah, to, to bring some of these monsters to life. Oh um, god, I can't. <laughs> it's all about Geralt is a monster. Like that yeah. is what he does. He yeah. hunts magical beasts. That is well, that is his pure so the, the season reason he will be, exists. It'll be twelve episode seasons, and only in the last two episodes do uh, do any monsters show up at all. <laughs> Other than that, it'll be mostly riding on horses and talking to old people. Yeah, DBZ style. We don't need any actual action. We just need narrative. That's what keeps us coming back in the episodes. I'm That's very what we just talked about. 
<laughs> You're skeptical as well? I think yes. it's going to be gold. I think it's going to be beautiful. Game to TV and movie transitions have yes. never been very kind. Ever. I know. I know there's With no like reason what, for me to believe exceptions? that this is, this is going to be good and there's an entire documented history of every single video game to movie or TV adaptation or vice versa being terrible, but you know what? When was the last time you as an adult saw a video game cinematic and said, oh, that's Hollywood level? Like Blizzard. Yeah, yeah I don't Blizzard. Even, but there's an yeah. adult, yeah. though, because, like, Warcraft, the movie, like, exists. That's true. So, like, it's a different standard. Games, and I, you know, this is biting the hand that feeds. I, I notedly am more mechanics-driven than narrative-driven. A lot of games are not written that well. The Witcher 3 might be, like, the best-written game of all time. But even still, I'm skeptical that it can transition easily to the to the small screen. That's right, though. Remember, the games are based on the books, so it already has a more narrative root. So, then, so that's why the Harry Potter... Wait, no, never mind. But the <laughs> thing... <laughs> you want to go down that road? <laughs> if it's less... If it's less, like monster focused more like narrative detective dialogue focused that's fine and it eliminates the problem of maybe the cgi being dicey but you still gotta like write and act well see now you said the witcher 3 might be the best written game of all time i don't know if you forgot i just want to make sure you remember that spec ops the line exists so oh you here we go. gotta make sure yeah. you give that you the pedestal the place yeah. <laughs> I but if it like i i would love for it to work that would be cool I think The Witcher has a better chance than, like, I, I, the worst thing is when it's like, you know, hey, popular video game that's sort of vapid is getting turned into a movie. You're like, who cares? Mm. Like uh, uh, Assassin's Creed, for Michael example. Fassbender. See, you got to take him out, out of the Ezio role take, into the Geralt role. Prince Prince of Persia. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember the hype around that one. Everybody's like, this is going to be the first one. Prince of Persia be. stopped being a game all of a sudden. They made so many of them. Fucking Jake Gyllenhaal happened to it, man. That's what happened. Ah. Witcher 3. Prince of Persia died when Assassin's Creed got popular. Oh, that's true, too, actually. Have you guys read the... Uh, it, it went viral like six weeks ago or something, but the interview with the Witcher writer and also... Oh, I forget who the other guy was. But the gist of it is basically that, you know, they're interviewing the Witcher writer, and they're like, how do you feel about the games? And oh, he's he like... Them. Yeah, he's like, well, eh, first off, they're not really for me. And secondly, <laughs> I think the books have helped the games more than the games have helped the books. And I'm like, oh, okay. So, like, he's one of those that's apps. actually just wrong, stubborn and <laughs> hilarious. But <laughs> that's like George R.R. R. Martin being like, mm, yeah, I think the, the books have really helped the show more than the show has helped the books. I'm not <laughs> saying one's better than the other, but the level of exposure is like, you know, a hundred times greater for one of them. Let's be real, George. Come on, man. Come on, buddy. Hey, Nick. Hello. Tell me about the Elgato Stream Deck, would you? Sure, I could do that. So Elgato has recently released a product, and when I say recently, I mean like this week, uh, and I happened to grab one, and what it is is a piece of hardware with 15 LED screen buttons on it that are customizable and programmable uh, with the idea of making it somewhat easier to have a, a physical interface for streamers or other you know people involved in any kind of technology really uh, that want to have some keys at the ready uh, because basically set up the way you want have some stuff ready to go press the buttons and stuff happens and at face value i heard that pitch and i said you know what? that's a really good idea why has nobody done that yet mm -hmm. uh, this is a 150 dollars product though so keep that in mind or, or what's the canadian price again is 280 well yeah i'm not sure if it's through like an authorized reseller or something i mean i'm on the page still but it's 298 canadian dollars that's like really uh, expensive from mm -hmm. elgato yeah so it's it is that's just shit, elgato. Man, yeah um this is not a sponsored thing by the way they they did not well, send me one nor did they give me any kind of anything it's public. because they they can't because this is you're their audience right Oh, you're the I only was, person buying it. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about that. I was like, man, like, I'm like Z-list internet famous. I might be able to get like a free unit of this. And I was like, why would they send me a free unit? <laughs> they did, though. They sent a ton of them out, actually. Did they? So they, yeah, they eliminated half. Yeah, them. They just ignored me. <laughs> they eliminated half of their potential consumer base via promotion. Yeah. That's like you run like a wastewater treatment facility or something. You're just giving out wastewater treatment. Yeah. You know, just anyway, bottles like, of wastewater treatment. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like I'm you're on, giving your service away to yeah, the biggest no, yeah, customer. I, I followed along. 
I'm trying to say I'm unbiased here. So I don't really care one way or the other, except for the money that I put into it, which whatever, it's a business expense. Good. So uh, my ultimate uh, thought on the matter is it's a pretty good idea. The software leaves a lot to be desired at this point, but has a lot of room for improvement and could get a lot better. Um, At the moment, the obvious thing is they want to kind of loop it in with their other Elgato streaming products. That was my uh, first question, actually, is if it's like... You're not locked into them, though, so okay. that you can get it regardless if you use OBS or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you look on their list of, like, macros and custom stuff, the top stuff's all the Elgato stuff, which is reasonable. Sure. Uh, I would imagine anybody would say it would be stupid of them not to have done it that way. Um, but props for not locking you into all Elgato stuff, because otherwise somebody else would immediately go, oh, I'll just make this and not have it be exactly. about Elgato. Yeah. And then they would have gotten my dollars there instead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the options that you have are fairly limited. If I pull up the software here, uh, for OBS, what you can do is you can toggle a scene on or off. You can toggle mixer audio, so you can set like your mic to be on or off. You can turn a source on or off. And that actually has some pretty cool, uh, pretty cool purposes that you can use that for. Uh, and they show stuff it, like you can have an animated GIF or a sound be triggered by pressing a button. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in the middle of your stream, if something happens, you can kind of dynamically react to that instead of having to know all these hotkeys and kind of fumble around with Three them. Three different air horns at various pitches. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay. That very thing. Good. Um, also worth mentioning, all of the 15 buttons can uh, hold a folder, and each one of those folders can have 14 more buttons within them. Mm-hmm. So it's not just 15. It's, you know, do the math, uh, which does help. Uh, you can also link it up with Twitter, and basically what it does is it'll give you a way to link your account to it, and when you press a button, it will tweet whatever you pre-specified. It's not dynamic at all, though, so you can't have it like say, pull the title from your Twitch stream and go, looks like I'll be streaming this when you press the button. It's always going to be the same message unless you change it, which why is that any better than actually just tweeting I want to be so shitty to you right now, man, because I want to be like, you know, they, they have a website for that. It's called yeah. twitter.com no, where you can type in a message that's and then I, click a button. And you send a that's tweet. exactly what I mean when I say yeah. the software has potential, but it isn't quite there yet. Like mm. there's no actual reason that that's useful other than you could make a folder of 14 options of what you want to tweet. Just like pre, yeah. Like mm-hmm. how, how fucking lazy are you at that? For, for real, can you, <laughs> this is a genuine question. Yeah. Can you nest a folder inside of a folder? No, it stops you, at one folder deep. They said they are open to doing that <laughs> in the future if people want it though. Because then, at that point, it's unlimited. You you could be busting out uh, like yeah, technically yeah. Li- it's limited by the the RAM. The, the brand of your the computer, process, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's the the main stuff, and then there's actually direct Twitch functionality with it. You can send a chat message, which again, same as the Twitter one. Like, why would you do that? I don't right, really understand yeah. the point of that at all. Uh, there's a special icon that represents your viewer total, which is kind of nice. You can have a physical representation of how many viewers are going at the time right in front of you. Unfortunately, the text for it is extremely tiny. Like, they don't offer you any options to customize the text that's on it, so hmm. kind of can't really see it very well. Hmm. Uh, you can set it to sub chat via a button, which is kind of nice. Yeah. You can also set it to slow chat and then specify how many seconds slow chat. So those are the exact type of things I want more of. Little commands that are nested within that have all the references taken care of. Right. Like they don't require you to script anything. They don't require you to know anything. They just give you a drop down menu. It says, how long do you want slow time to be? Or, or other varieties of things like that. Uh, and that's where the OBS stuff gets a little janky because a lot of it is just, do you want a hotkey reference to a thing you can already have a hotkey to? I want you to remove hotkeys because I don't know how many conflicting hotkeys I might have outside of your software. Mm-hmm. So for example, if I make it like control shift F for something, and then I also use that in Winamp for something, and I press the hotkey for streaming stuff, it might also trigger the Winamp thing. I want you to do all the hotkey stuff on your end. So that way, I just want the command to do what it does, press the button, it does the thing. That's like the whole point, I would think. Keep going, I'll be right. It is. And yeah. in this case, it's really just referencing things that it already can do. But there are exceptions, like I said, of some things that are linked directly through their own API, like the OBS stuff. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's also, you can press a button, have it pull up a website, which i not sure again what the use of that is. because I, have, you have, I have that on my keyboard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like this one, though. There's a hotkey switch. And what this does is it'll, it'll allow you to specify two different hotkeys with two different icons and two different titles. So when you press it, it'll trigger something, then it'll switch to the other one. And if you press it again, it'll do the other thing and switch back to the first one. Okay. So in this case, it's not just a press it and forget it kind of thing. It's actually got 
some versatility to it. Yeah. So I want to see more of that kind of stuff showing up in the software in the future. Uh, there's also just a one press hotkey. So if you have a thing you want to trigger once, every time you press it, it'll do that. I have it set up right now to be my soundboard essentially. Um, so you can open a multimedia file and it'll just play it. And then if you set up your uh, Windows player properly, it'll just close after the fact. Um, you can have it directly open any file on your computer. So if you want it to open like Photoshop or another app, mm -hmm. whatever you want it to be, you can just set up an icon for it. Yeah. Um, and you can lastly, you can do multimedia stuff. So if you want to do play, pause, skip on your music functionality. So there's, a, there's a small argument to be made here that this could be practical for not just streamers, but for anybody looking to set up quick yeah. macros. So I was thinking like, uh, I mean, it's too expensive for, for that generalized use in my right. opinion. Yeah, definitely. But I have seen people like, you know, Nick, you can buy like those Wacom uh, remotes. Yeah. And then those basically hook into Photoshop or uh, an Illustrator yes. program natively with shortcuts. But you can just do that with this instead and then macro or connect the macro for opening those programs or those tools to the, the stream deck itself. But you could yeah. also theoretically do that with like an, a USB like numpad. You could, like but in this case, the one reason that I thought this was a superior solution is that it's got screens on it. So you yeah. can customize stuff, have saved profiles, and whatever you're doing, like it's there with the, the info in front of you. Yeah. Whereas if you buy a little hotkey thing, you got to like write on little pieces of paper and slip them under mm -hmm. the keys. Mm -hmm. This is like straight up silly, but the most meaningless, like least entertaining question I've ever asked on a roundtable <laughs> for the LCD screen. <laughs> Are yeah. there default template images that can be used for things and or can you put your custom images in? <laughs> I, was, I was actually going to talk about that regardless if you asked that or not. Oh. Yeah. So that's another shortcoming of the software is there is, but it's not built into the software. You've got to go to a part of their website okay. it up and then export it as a JPEG. But you can make your own in Photoshop. Uh, what I did is I took one of their blank templates, just exported it, Pull that into Photoshop, cut out the corner rounded edges, and then I can just drag images into it and save them as JPEGs. So, you know, you can do it all through their stuff, but you don't have it all in one spot, which is super lame. Like, you got to go to their website, set it up, change it. You won't be able to save it separately. You got to do it and save it, and then, you know, it's a whole thing. Honestly, I've still been considering uh, for my little button that is uh, macro to launch Rocket League on my keyboard. I've been considering... <laughs> yeah. Cutting out a little Rocket League logo on paper and just taping it to it because I I made a it. between the buried and me button so whenever I want to start mm. playing random between the buried and me music I can just press the button and off it goes which Fuck is yeah. cool. not Very really good. a thing a lot of people need to do but for me yeah. um, and again this is not a sponsored thing I have sort of a middling uh, opinion of the thing I don't think it's worth 150 bucks and I think right now it's especially not because the software needs to catch up uh, but in maybe a year when it comes down a little in price and the software has a lot more features. I'd say, yeah, probably check it out. There'll probably be some competition by then, too. Mm -hmm. so. This kind of reminds me, did you ever uh, play with that custom desktop tool called Rain Meter, Nick? Yeah, yeah I did. did. Yeah, I figured you would have played it. I'm big on the, the Windows modding kind of customization yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to buy this. Yeah? You think so? Yeah. Hmm. I think, the basically, it's stupid as hell. <laughs> and like for my, obviously if you've ever seen a show that I do I don't do anything that requires this level of customizability but I do think that having potentially 210 sound files at a fingertip <laughs> is exactly what I want yeah I want to like a to remember what they are <laughs> like if something goes wrong or you know well, I Get the I, Price is Right failure th song to I'm not setting up the soundboard. You got to get the wave files and put them together. That's fine. I can... <laughs> like, and the other thing is, like, it is it's way too expensive, but it's, and you can make your own, but I'm going to spend, like, four days making my own to save, like, you know, 100 bucks. And I'm not going to make one with 15 LC yeah. screens on it. Like, that's right. just not plausible. So this seems sensible to me as a really stupid purchase. Plus, in a way, I actually respect that um, Elgato is making tools for streamers. And part of the, the rub of being in an industry is you, because it's a niche audience, you pay more than it's worth, probably, you know? I think you're kind of paying for the aesthetic a little bit here too. I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. It's a convenience thing, yeah. I don't know of a solution that's like this with the software with the LCD screens. Yeah. I mean, you can probably make one, like you said, but this is kind of just ready to go out of the box. 
which is where the extra money is going. And, you know, I just figured I'd go into fairly good detail about this because I've watched quite a few videos and it doesn't seem like anybody's really used it yet mm -hmm. and have like opinions about it that I've seen. So since people asked me, I was like, hey, might as well. Yeah, no, I'm sure there's quite minutes. a few folks that were curious. So we appreciate it. Now, what I wanted to do is have a button that will execute an EXE file that I wrote myself. And then that EXE file executes all the stuff custom that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you can uh, do that. What, it, what is that file type called, Nick, that you the use? The bat file. That's it, yeah. I was going to call it a tarball. Come on, some. Unity tar confirmed. There, there are, there's a compression type called TAR. So That's it. Yeah, so you need one button launches, uh, what is it called again? This a guy's unit. No, no kidding, huh, Matt? This <laughs> Unity certified developer up here. Yeah, come on, of... man. And it's not really to do with Unity. <laughs> that has actually nothing to do with Unity, but. <laughs> All right. I didn't put the air horn on it yet, guys. I, uh, if you want to send me sound files, that'll be a helpful thing. Dude, swear to God, three different pitches of air horn is all you need. That'll yeah. carry you to victory. I can set the pitches. I just don't have the air horn uh, outside of my phone yet. Hey, uh, hey, Ryan. Oh, hey, what's, hey, up, Brian? what's up, Brian? Who's Brian? Hey, Brian. <laughs> we don't want to get into this Brian stuff, I promise you. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Greg, you want to tell me about Strafe? Yeah, Strafe is a roguelite first-person shooter that is extremely dedicated to the 1996 aesthetic, uh, except for the fact that you actually have the ability to freely aim instead of just aiming directly in front of your person. So you start, you choose a gun, and then you go through these procedurally generated levels. Sometimes you got to do the FPS thing where you grab keys and then use the keys to open color-coded gates and stuff like that. But mostly you're just trying to live. You gather resources. You use those resources to buy ammunition because you run out constantly. And uh, then eventually you die. And that is Strafe. Dope. <laughs> Nick, do you echo the thoughts? Strafe is not great. Yes, I've heard. I've heard as much as well. Yeah, I've heard it spent more money on its like um, PR budget than on the actual game. Wow, <laughs> Strafe is like a really good pitch wrapped in a game that's not that fun. Oh. Is the thing is like it's it's a good idea. It's like hey, remember those first person shooters from the. 1990s let's just apply like a modern framework to that and it'll be cool but most of the time it ends up just being kind of boring and despite being procedurally generated like very very samey in my experience yeah, a lot of hallways you're, you're right about that a lot of hallways and then like big rooms with exactly the same enemy just running at you i want to come down a little less hard on it but still sort of hard on it I had a lot of expectations going into this one thing. It was going to be amazing because I actually, I played it years ago and it was still very early in development. I didn't even know it was going to end up being a full game. Uh, and at that time, it seemed about as done as it is now, mm. sort of. <laughs> I mean, they, they wrapped it up in the whole roguelike framework a little bit better. And now there are actually discrete areas, whereas in prior, I think it was only the spaceship area. Uh, and it's broken up sort of like Spelunky where there's, uh, I think it's either... Is it two somewhere between two and four zones within each sub zone? So like the first ones are the spaceship, and then you go to like a town or something. I, I don't actually know the thing because I've never beaten level three. But once you beat an area, you can spend money to open up portals that take you past the first one straight to the second one. Like if you wanted to go to the ice caves, essentially, you could okay. jump ahead. Hmm. Um, it's extremely badly balanced, though, is the problem, <clears throat> and it's just not that fun. The idea is great, and it's very visceral. It's fun to play, but it just breaks you down with the difficulty very quickly. Uh, Wait, hold like on. Brian so said, the enemies mostly just run at you, which is lame. Elaborate on that a bit for me. Though. It's, like, it's not fun, but it's still like fun to just Yeah, the, the gunplay is fun. Yeah. But the way the game mechanics sort of force you to just die over and over with no actual semblance of actual progression is not fun, especially when the soundtrack is kind of like overly loopy like, it's just, it's short. It, you just hear the same bit over and over on level one. Yeah. Um, the level generation doesn't have enough hooks to it. It's very similar from one run to the next. And there just isn't enough diversity to make it really that interesting. I mean, you pick from one of three weapons to start off with, which seems fine, uh, especially since you can upgrade them. But during the course of upgrading, you might only see one upgrade through the first couple of levels, and you'll run into these one-off weapons that you can shoot for a little bit, but you only get one clip with. 
and you don't get nearly enough of those. You're basically just using the one weapon you get always until you upgrade it, and you might get an upgrade you don't like. So, like, that's it for gunplay. Is You better like the gun you picked. Yeah. And it's going to be a machine gun, which is awful, a shotgun, which is obviously superior, and a rail gun, which is, like, in the middle. Hmm. Also... I mean, maybe this has been patched because we played it like almost two weeks ago now, but the guns have no game feel to them at all. No you recoil? Like, yeah, exactly. Like mm. to me, it really feels like you are holding, like you're holding a 3D model object in front of you and projectiles are just spewing out of it. There's oh, no like yeah, yeah. kickback. Oh. There's no like visceral yeah. sense of like, dunk, 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 mm. you know? Like when we were playing Quake Champions, like if you're using those guns and there's a lot of mm -hmm. negative things i'm sure you can say about quake champions but they each have their own unique feel and when you have the rocket launcher even though the rockets are small and i thought it was some kind of weird flat cannon <laughs> like it feels like you've got a heavy weapon there's explosions that happen there's like yeah. feedback visually and audio auditorily from the game that you're shooting whereas in strafe it's really just like like your gun yeah. it, it really does not feel like you're shooting yeah it. i can tell they put all the attention that normally goes to that into what happens to the enemies after you hit them with the projectiles the inordinate amounts of work went into the detail and the gore and the gibbs and the blood yeah. flying off the walls and like individual little rivulets of blood running down the wall which is like that one thing stands out as having so much more work than so many other things huh. and the trailers and the trailers, but I'm kind of putting that stuff to the side to just talk about the game. I mean, I, I I can believe that they really went heavy with the PR campaign, too. In fact, I remember last PAX going to the booth, the Devolver booth. They had a strafe section of it that was like, well, they had the tower that you were playing the game on looked like one of those old Dell machines from 96 that's like a fucking kitchen garbage can. And, nice. you know, it's... I don't know why they were so adamant about, you know keeping that theme alive with all this stuff even though like i mean i guess that is sort of the whole point is right like the people that will like this are the people that enjoyed these fps's from 96 yeah. but well i want to i want to tackle that for a second because uh pardon me while i parrot you know somebody else who played sure. it um but i'm curious because i'm curious if it rings true for the two of you who have played it um specifically tb said in his video like the reason 90 the shooters from 96 were so good even the new doom is so good it's because the levels are meticulously created to be arenas that you can move around and have fun. You try all these different weapons and allows you uh, the freedom to exploit the movement. And, and it's like, it's arcade in that way. But this game, because it's randomly generated, doesn't have that level of detail. So like you said, you're running down hallways and you don't get to have that experience. So as much as it looks like it's from 96, it doesn't play yeah. like one of those games yeah. from 96 is it's that, just dead ends all the time is that like, right you think you're going somewhere to progress the level find out you just hit a complete dead end and then realize you have nowhere to go that makes any sense that you realize and then you look at your map which is like you position the camera down into the left yeah here the map and your awful. arm comes up and you can't see anything on the map oh it's that's... so pixelated <laughs> well, did, i think you madness you, you through tb have touched yeah. on like a valid point that it says that it has like this ridiculous adherence to the 1996 aesthetic but it's really it makes weird design decisions that are at odds with that like allowing you complete freedom of aiming i'm, I'm actually glad they did because i i can't play like a doom style shooter like a yeah. doom 2 style shooter in this day and age or like wolfenstein 3d but like the fact that you have to not only reload, but your ammunition is limited. And then mm -hmm. we were kind of trying to suss out, do you lose the ammo that's left in your clip if you reload before the clip is completely empty? If so, like, I get it, but this isn't Red Orchestra. Like, you're making a game that's the aesthetic and the, like, the selling point is that it's supposed to be so arcadey, right. and yet... You're you're doing like super simulation y mechanics for bullets that even like Call of Duty doesn't do. Yeah. Which is not a simulation, but is certainly more like simulated or simulatory. It has more than reason to do straight. that than straight. It, exactly. Does. Yeah. 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 The temperament of development is such that you would expect they would put all of their eggs in the basket of fun 
not exactly, things that yeah. cause the player to have a worse time because it's simulation. That's mm -hmm. kind of, I think, where we're going. And then, yeah, exactly. And then running out of ammo means you have to, well, or at least if you're bad, like I am, you have to go spend your whatever you get, shells, on ammunition instead of being able to buy HP or armor or, you know, whatever else you can spend your resources on. So I always just feel like I'm playing that, like, gungeon like bit novice gungeon game where I'm like spending all of my resources on HP just to stay yeah. alive and like die die later. Yeah. Instead of actually having a chance to build a winnable. That's ride. the Dead Cells game I'm playing right now. Oh yeah. Dude. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, Dead Cells is just better than. Well, uh, Dead Cells is excellent. <laughs> we'll talk about not, that in a minute. Right, not to be like a different kind of game. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, but. They're, they're kind of comparable, kind of a little Here's, bit. The thing is, like, straight. I don't want to insult the developers, but it's like, it's just... I don't think I would have liked the game if they delivered what they promised. So they're kind of screwed from my standpoint, yeah. whether they do or they don't. Sure. But I don't necessarily think they did right by the um, the design pitch that they seem to have for the... For Gimmick the over substance. How about, yeah. how about this? I know I would have liked what they were <laughs> pitching me on and I have five hours in it, so I gave it more than a chance to get me, yeah, and yeah. I never beat the beginning of level three. Wow. That's... In five hours. And I, I'm not saying I'm great at first-person shooters, especially if you watch me play Quake the other day, but I do have a lot of time in them over the years, and it's not like I don't pick up on the nuance of how you're supposed to play them. Mm -hmm. So I, I was missing something drastic, or it's really imbalanced. Also, I haven't played Cigarette, but I still to this day have mm -hmm. not found, like, First person shooter roguelite that I think is great. I've played a few of them that I think are good to okay. I mean, we all know what games I'm talking about. Yeah. I don't need to like necessarily drudge up every single example, but yeah. I'm still waiting on like that first person shooter plus roguelite formula that hits. And I definitely do not think strafe strafe might be the worst of them. I was actually because I didn't I didn't realize Strafe was actually going to be a roguelite until it came out. I thought it was going to be yeah, like a same actually. single player. Yeah, it was just going to be a experience. linear experience or uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was just going to be a linear experience that harkened back to that, you know, mid 90s era shooter yeah. with some modern takes and then I heard roguelike and I'm like okay, that doesn't make any <laughs> why. Because everything has to be a roguelike now. Like in this, just to, like the past three weeks, I feel like we've had like four different roguelikes come out. Yeah, no, you're, you're not wrong. One of them has crushed it. Yeah. Yes, one of them has crushed it. <laughs> one of them, redneck. before we yeah. get to that well, though, let me I talk. Need to play that. This is a perfect segue, Bear. You're missing out. I know, yeah, because they've been talking about this goddamn game the entire time too, and that'd, that'd be Quake Champions. We're going to throw off your docket, man. Just uh, shift it around. Oh, <laughs> just cut him off mid work. <laughs> They've been talking about this too. Quake Champions. Quake Champions. I want to hear uh, from Nick first on that one. Quake Champions is the reimagining, re rebirth, I guess you could say, of the Quake 3 arena shooter formula where you get some friends together, make a little team, go online, shoot the hell out of each other. It's a very simple type of game. Uh, but this is not a very simple type of time we live in. So they had to augment what we knew to be a very simple concept and Damn add hogs. visual shit now, which is the loot crates and the unlockable customization options. Um, so if you know the way Quake used to be, it's just here's a collection of levels, get your friends together, shoot each other. Uh, it's got like 30 skins you could change your character to, but who really cares? It's just the guy you pick. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. But the premise of Quake Champions is it now matters which guy you pick because they each have their own little subtle ability to it. And I will give them credit here they didn't go over the top with the abilities and make it like the thing you lean on all the time. I mean, you can play with it more or less depending on your preference, but you could kind of just ignore it for the most part and not probably make a huge difference if you're any good. Mm -hmm. um, they updated graphically, of course. Uh, game still runs very smooth. Feels like Quake, still very, very quick. Uh, they've added a few new weapons, kind of reimagined some of them to be a little different than what they were. Uh, still got a rail gun, though, so that felt good. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got a much more apathetic sounding announcer for this one as well. He is bear. You should apply to work <laughs> <laughs> because, like, seriously, the announcer is like they have the obelisk. Oh, really? Yeah, he kind of doesn't give it. It sounds like placeholder sound, yeah. actually. It's like <laughs> until they get the real guy, they just got maybe somebody from the QA team guy. or something. Yeah. Well, shit. The enemy has the obelisk. I better send him a reel. Okay. Yeah, do it. 
Uh, so we played the sort of closed open beta where anyone can get in, but you've got to request a code. And it's got three maps and three game modes, uh, Deathmatch, Team Deathmatch, and this other sort of new one where it's like a combination of Capture the Flag and Domination. You have to like hold a soul and then stand by an obelisk. Oh, yeah, it's a little right. confusing, honestly. I'm not really sure what we were doing for most of it. Um, I only got to try out three of the, I think it was eight heroes. Uh, the main guy, the Quake guy that you normally get as the default, he can throw his little ball and then teleport to it. And then when you teleport to it, he can telefrag somebody if you're in line with it. You can also just use that for general mobility. Uh, there's a lady that can go invisible, and when she comes out of being invisible, she can frag whoever's in front of her. Uh, and then there's a guy with a mask for a face that can see through walls. So there, that's three of them. There's also a dinosaur that shoots acid blood, mm -hmm. a lady that leaves a trail that lights people on fire, uh, a lady that leaves a totem on the ground that either heals you or damages you depending on your team. Mm -hmm. A robot that has a shield. They, mostly all of these have an analog to Overwatch. I've oh, I was looking to say, yeah. it sounds like Overwatch. Mm -hmm. There is one dude who is a robot and he has Ruckus's slash Reinhardt's shield. Yeah. Uh, oh, and there's a... People, are, say, people shit on Paladins for it. And exactly. Shit on Quake. Yeah. There's a Rhino Man that charges too. Course, so that, that's a thing. And yeah, they do have different stats. They have slightly different HP. Uh, the lady that goes invincible, or invisible rather, uh, she only has 75 health, which kind of sucks because she's super easy to kill. Um, anyway, There's what a large man talk with about? a hammer named Reenhort. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was a little put off by the way that they're structuring the unlocks in that you just don't get all the stuff. You've got to play 100 matches sure, and yeah. slowly unlock the characters. They also let you rent characters for a day at a really? time. So if you want to try one out, you can spend the easy-to-get currency and then keep one for 24 hours, and then hmm. you can maybe get them out of a loot crate later, or you can pay the harder-to-get currency to get them directly. That's uh, I'm cool, still not though. sure how many characters is going to be in total and how difficult the currency will be to obtain. So at this point, I don't know what my opinion is yet, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't love it, but I also don't think it's a showstopper either. I like that the rental pro system. That's neat. I'd like to see that employed in other games. I actually hate it. Really? <laughs> and not just to be <laughs> divisive. And by the way, I think I want to preface this by saying I actually like Quake Champions so far. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing about it is that in an era where getting shot once in the head takes you out of the game forever, because I've been playing mm -hmm. so much Battlegrounds. This is really like, it's not a low skill game at all, but it is a little mindless in the sense that you can mm -hmm. go in and just play yeah. and not have to worry about it. Like if you die, then you're in misery for 40 minutes or something. <laughs> but I hate it because the stupid, it just complicates not even the design. I just don't understand what I'm looking at when I load up the main screen. There's three kinds of in-game currency. And then there's three kinds of loot chests that you can get. I don't know if they correspond or you can upgrade one to the other or what. Then you can rent the heroes. When you open the loot boxes, you don't just get like, you don't get skins anymore. There's like torso shaders, leg shaders, like mask shaders. Wow. There's just, there's so the Garbage. amount of loot and the different ways to get it is so muddied that like yeah. I can't, I just don't know what I'm looking at at all mm. ever. The solution that I got from this, from playing a bit of it, is that you just kind of play games and you get crates for leveling. I, the currency is on top of it and I'm not clear on that part, but I did get the hardest to get crate just by playing games. Okay. And that did unlock one of the characters. And since there are very few characters, I assume that's a, a very high value pull to yeah, get from yeah. that chest um, I agree though it's super muddy and complicated and overly complicated I mean especially when mostly all of the things you're getting are just cosmetic silly things like why do you have to make it so complicated so yeah. it doesn't sound like you necessarily have an issue with the rental system then it's just that the loot, the loot in the inventory itself is extremely difficult to navigate it, it's just like one more thing on top of it okay. like Brett I come from the era of there's two kinds of currency there's in-game currency that you earn, and then there's, like, money. diamonds that you put yeah. your real money into. Yeah. Right. And in this one, there's in-game currency that you earn. There's, uh, I forget what the ones, they're like, radiation or something. You, you pay money. There's favor, and then there's shards, and then there's one other one. So the, the one that I don't understand is the one that's, like, in the middle. 
Oh, that you told me. That's dust where you... Yeah, you break down your shaders to turn into things you can then spend to get other shaders. Yes. <laughs> and I just want to be Quake Man and shoot my rocket launcher at people, which is okay because I heard that there is a... Uh, a mod, well, I don't know how to say it, a skew coming out where you can just buy the whole game and you get everything like Overwatch style. So they might be going the Killer Instinct route, which is to release it piecemeal and then also the whole game for a price. But I don't know if they're intending it to be free initially or what, if you get the, the limited edition. No, uh, here's a, limited here's a edition quote. is not the right word to use to describe that. The uh, constrained edition. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a bit more complicated than the actual game to just break into the, the monetization scheme of it, honestly. As far as that's, that's concerned, creative director Tim Willits uh, said at its core, it's a free-to-play game with the option to buy the champion packs and just get in and play uh, with all the champions. Okay. So the smite way of doing things. Yeah. And to be fair, Overwatch, and, and Chad's right about this, Overwatch doesn't let you buy in and get all the skins. If you want skins, you still got to buy loot boxes yeah. Or, yeah. or earn them at an incredibly slow pace after like 30 hours. But... I I just want the characters. Like yeah. on the same boat, I played like some Heroes of the Storm with Kate, and I have like just for playing, I got like twenty heroes. Yeah, they give you a free twenty heroes of yeah. two point oh. And then Kate you was want like, assassins tanks. Kate's like, you should play as this guy, and I went to my inventory, and it was like, I don't have that guy. And then right. she's like, well, just unlock him, and I was like, well, I don't have, you know, what Chirons or whatever the heck they're called. <laughs> And then no, just get some Chiron. To, <laughs> let's establish now like a universal currency that every game can use as yeah. like this is how you buy shit. We need to shards is probably it. Let's just call, call everything well, shards. The Heroes of the Storm also has three currencies now with two point. They've got gold, they've got shards, and they've got real world money. You can do they call it real world money? And then they just like charge you straight up. You want this hero? It's like four ninety nine. It's just yeah. got USD. Yeah. You know, why not just do that? I mean, fucking Microsoft points went away because people were like, "I just want to see what I'm buying for money." Dude, yeah. not yeah. not to uh, not to pump their tires too hard, and we all know there's problems with Nintendo's online services. But when you buy games online, you no longer have to buy like Wii points. It, you can buy oh them God, if, yeah. if you want, like because we're buying stuff in Canada, obviously, the prices are weird. And they're never 15 or 20 bucks. They're always like 17, 35 or something. Yeah. Um, there's an option. You can get 15 bucks, you can get 20 bucks. I don't know why you ever would. Or you can just be like, just add exactly enough money to purchase this game. Yes. And I'm like, that should be the only option. Exactly. Yeah. That's what PlayStation does too. Yeah, yeah they've done is. that now too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I hope this monetization talk hasn't distracted too much from the actual game because the actual game is fine like it's pretty much what it says on the tin uh if you disregard all of that business about how it's complicated like it's just quake 3 with a better graphics engine it's just as smooth as it ever was it looks great um i really like the maps actually i have to say i, I was paying very careful attention to the level design and they i don't know if they kept the same people that did the quake 3 level design i know one of the maps was actually uh, an upgrade from a direct Quake 3 level, but the ones that weren't really looked very much like they could have been Quake 3 maps. And they were well designed, and I like them, and I can't wait to see more. They had some really cool visual gimmickry, uh, which is not a thing Quake was really known for quite as much. That was more Unreal's thing. Uh, but these had some really cool focal points to them visually, even though you're flying past them shooting rockets. It's kind of cool every now and then. You just look around, and you're like, oh, there's like a million floating islands over there. That's mm. neat. Uh, There's like a chained up eyeball in one of them. That was that was a big focal point because yeah. it's an eye. Um, and in general, just had that kind of macabre, uh, dark, I almost said Dark Souls, but it, in a way I'm not <laughs> even wrong, uh, just kind of gothic architecture uh, creepiness to it. Yeah. And I like that about Quake. Visually, Sweet. very nice. Um, gameplay seems to be fine. It's very smooth, very fast. Had no issues with connections, really. Uh, we had Is a few issues. Here? Well, once we got into a party, I should say. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of to be expected in everything these days. It I just sort of say, played like Halo, get in a group and go. The people who are like, because there was a lot of this in chat. People were like, oh, it's just Overwatch. I, I don't see it, especially because, I mean, the aesthetic is extremely not Overwatch. Mm. And it also seems like it's way more based on um, me mechanical skill as opposed to differences in between right. characters. Not every team shooter is Overwatch. I, exactly. Just because they have their own abilities, I don't think that means that. 
I think it's cool know. that we're seeing first person shooters integrate like a unique abilities per character. It adds variety to the gameplay. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's Overwatch. The principal problem right now is that the matchmaking is in a weird place in that I feel oh, like the skill levels are off. You yes. Mean, yeah. I feel like a lot of the people playing Quake Champions have like 10 years of experience in Quake 3. So when we boot up a party and it's like me, Rob, Nick, and Cobalt, and then we're going up against people who are like, you know, level 25 or something like that, it feels wrong to do so. And in a way that kind of compromises the enjoyment because you're just getting bunny hopped to Christ and <laughs> destroyed. It's but. a hardcore community though. It's always kind of been that way. Even sure. back in the days of Quake 3 being the thing, like you would get just creamed all yeah. the time. Well, hopefully they do like a matchmaking system when the game comes out. Then. Well, but the problem is even the people that are new to, to Quake Champions are still not necessarily new. Well, yeah, but I'm saying like hopefully when the game comes <laughs> out, they'll rock it up really quickly. Yeah, I guess. The newer people. Right. Where right. they belong, mm -hmm. I guess. I, I would be surprised if they don't figure that out. Yeah, that seems yeah. like one of the most important features of getting this game going uh, to a new community. For sure. And, and I hope people don't dismiss it as just being Overwatch, because I think to do that is to kind of ignore that this is kind of where yeah. uh, online deathmatch started, in a way. I mean, like, the game that I actually feel like I can compare it to the most is Lawbreakers. Like, mm -hmm. it feels like a, a faster Space Marine or Lawbreakers. Uh -huh. I, I would go, I mean, we, we played it, like, last year at PAX, and it was still in, like, pre-alpha or something, but I was like, Quake about Champions. Lawbreakers? Yeah, yeah. We saw it at E3. Oh, yeah, E3. That's right, yeah. I was like, Quick Champions is like a more... It's got more character than the Lawbreakers, Lawbreakers is going to be back this E3. I got the invite. I'm like, won't be there. I kind of want that game to be good, but when Me we too. played it, I was like, this is wicked generic. Generic? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, uh, I think we both walked away saying the same thing. I was like, wow, that was... A uh, brown shooter. Yeah, it, it, it's not brown though. It's silver. Silver. It's, silver shooter. It's like Gray. the most silvery shooter. <laughs> yeah, I really uh, like silvery I stuff. Know, Maybe I should check it out. I don't know why when you say lawbringers, I can't or is lawbreakers. Yeah, lawbreakers. Law I can't not think of the. I think it's doorbusters. That top-down game where <laughs> yeah, door, yeah. Kickers. Door, kickers. Oh, door kickers. Door kickers. That's the one. Yeah. Doorbusters is the sale they do at Sears. Correct. You to come yeah, out sorry. early in the morning. All right. Now we've gone full circle with this thing. Good. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there we go. There's Quake Champions currently in the uh, open closed beta. Uh, you can go to. You know, it. I made that up. I don't know if they're calling it that, but it's closed beta. They're calling closed, it closed beta. beta. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can go to quake.bethesda.net if you're interested in playing the closed beta yourself. There we go. I'll probably buy it. Yeah. I, I don't good. think I want to do the like. I just want one hero thing. I think I'll just buy, probably buy it. Yeah. Right on. I'm kind of torn because I think like I'd just be Quake Man for the length of time that I'm going to play that game. <laughs> right. yeah. I feel like I'm okay just being Quake Man. Yeah. Okay. Not to each other. Quake Man. Quake Man. So uh, I'm going to make these next couple real quick because I know we're going to have a lot to say about Dead Cells. So I'm just going to go uh, real quick past these ones. Uh, first up is NBA Playgrounds. It's the new two on two NBA game from who developed this one? This was by Saber Interactive. Uh, if you like NBA Jam, you should play that, because this is not as good as that. This is <laughs> sort of just not a great NBA game at all. I've put a couple hours into it now, played a little bit online as well, and I am not really thrilled with what I've experienced so far. Yo, Saber Interactive is also working on Quake Champions. Oh, that's crazy. That is, that is crazy. very strange. That is really <laughs> weird. <laughs> They should stick to that. They clearly, yeah, they've got their priorities somewhere else, uh, and that's very obvious. Uh, yeah, so NBA Playgrounds, it's uh, it's two on wait, two. Wait, 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 wait. Yo. Halo also made, or sorry, uh, Saber Interactive also made Halo the Master Chief Collection, or worked on it. Oh. What'd they do? What did they do <laughs> that's a great question. What did they do? On what did they do they did me? also work on RIPD, the game. I know that, that one. They that. did also work on <laughs> the Battle Los Angeles video game from Konami. Mm. Uh, immortalized, of course, in Poison Mushroom episode. Oh, yeah. I yeah, know. that's coming back, right? No. <laughs> R.A.P.D. You were like a vampire cop or something? NBA fighting Playgrounds a is Jeff a 2v2 basketball <laughs> action game <laughs> that... You know, honestly, I don't have a ton to say about it. The fucking theme song sounds like it was written by Aaron Carter. There's no online unless you unlock it. 
Uh, there's no private matches in the online. Apparently, they're patching that in, but it's not there right now. Uh, playing it is just clunky. And one thing I in particular hate, I mentioned this to you guys before the show, but the inbounding is ridiculous. It's so stupid. It's It kills all the momentum of the game, and when you're playing online, it's so systematic that the opponent can just predict exactly when it's going to be passed in and immediately steal the ball from What you. is inbounding for people that don't speak inbounding basketball? Inbounding is when you, after, after your opponent scores, you get the ball back and you pass it into your teammate from out of bounds. So you get the ball after they have scored and you're standing there and you have to wait. Like, you can't actually control it. You just have to wait until the whistle blows and then the ball is automatically passed out to your teammate. And it doesn't work, especially not online, <laughs> because people just fucking steal the ball. How did that not come up? Uh, also, the shooting is dumb. There's no indication of when you're actually supposed to shoot, which is an old uh, trope from like NBA Live 2014 or something, where they, they had that in an NBA Live game. You had no indication when you're supposed to release the shot. And that's like a that's principle number one, I think, for an NBA game is uh, be aware of when you're supposed to shoot. But anyway, I'm probably getting into the nitty gritty of this too much. It's suffice to say, this is not a very fun NBA game. So there you go. That's NBA Playgrounds. It's not. I, I would not recommend it. I'd, I'd just go play NBA Jam again. Cool. Cool. Neat. Neat arena. There we go. Neat. That was not Quake Champions, by the way. I know the topic is lying to you, but that was that was NBA Playgrounds. And now we're going to move yeah, on. That was very upset. I'm they sorry. didn't know what you were I'm talking very about. very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to go back into Bears VR corner for a few minutes, so everybody put on your goggles and get ready for this. Uh, for, uh, <laughs> for another round of VR. It's uh, this one. This one is really, really close, I think, actually, to being that, that, that magical little morsel that might entice you guys back. This one's called Tethered. Came out a couple months ago, actually. I hadn't even gotten the chance to play it yet, but uh, apparently it's gotten uh, better recently as well. <laughs> Uh, it is a strategy game. Kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, Black and White, that super old god game from, like, 1995 or something like that. It, Peter Molyneux before he went bad. Exactly. Before he, he Molyneux bad? himself. <laughs> <laughs> like he bad. went to the dark so side, man. <laughs> 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 yeah, he before he started rotten. worrying about putting emotion in all of his games. Mm -hmm. Why are you holding that like it's a fucking Star Trek he's device? Get, like you're yeah, getting he's getting the codec in, in his ear from, like... <laughs> I hear you loud and clear, Bear. Please yeah, continue. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Okay. Uh, Tethered is, uh, first of all, it's a really good-looking VR game, which I have not oh, seen okay. a ton of. The art direction in Tethered is pretty fantastic. Uh, they've got these adorable little critters that you're controlling. I think they're, oh, what are they called? It's going to bother me. I don't remember what they're called. They've got an adorable name, too. Hold on. Hold on. You control your peeps. That's right. They're called peeps, and they're so cute. They're these little guys. Kind of look like these uh, sort of Lemmings-esque characters uh, that you can assign different roles and uh, kind of build a little community and you are defending yourself from these little cat caterpillar monsters that will uh, show up in your world. So it's not that enticing when you just present it that way. It just sort of seems like another god game. But the, uh, the way that they allow you uh, to utilize the... VR controls and like the motion control and your whole body within that space is really interesting for this sort of game because you you do have to like move around and rotate the map and be looking all around but physically you know like yourself walking from point to point or otherwise dragging and re rotating things to keep a constant eye on all the different pieces of your little community so you've got you'll have like your farm over here you've got your uh, mines your quarry over here and then you've got like uh, something else like you're building a different building on the other side of the map so you're having to manage these different things all while like kind of moving around and uh, being aware of everything that's going on on the map and then at night your uh, your little peeps will start to come back to town you'll have to defend yourself against uh, those caterpillar looking dudes that I mentioned so it's it's kind of got like a, a, a really cutesy adorable vibe to it but it is also pretty intense like especially during the combat you find yourself having to really quickly move back and forth and uh, manage things and make sure that uh, you're not losing resources in a, pr in a particular place or you're not being uh, overwhelmed in an area, you know? It's, it's, it's cool. It's got a good actual sense of gameplay to it, which a lot of these VR games that I've talked about, they really don't have a lot of 
a lot of depth to them, you know, but I think Tethered is one of the first ones that uh, definitely is game first before it's a VR experience, but they do both well, so I was, I was pretty impressed by it. And uh, yeah, that's it. So there's Tethered. I recommend that one too. It's uh, twenty four ninety nine. There haven't been a lot of God games, so this no. is kind of neat that somebody's still doing one. And it makes sense uh, with VR, too. Like, it's one of the few genres I think that would really translate well to it, and I think they've done a pretty damn good job here. So there we go. There's Tether. Another VR recommendation for you if you're interested. Uh, and then, real fast as well, uh, Mathis, I want to hear your thoughts on the Sundered beta. I don't like it. You don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell uh, me why. It's made up. We still got a, few, we got, still got a couple more months before it's out. Yep. It is the new game uh, coming out by Thunder Lotus, the people who developed Yotun. Mm -hmm. um, it is a gorgeously animated uh, 2D roguelite Metroidvania-esque game. It's Metroidvania, yeah. With uh, the upgrade system that, that reminds me of like Flint Hook or something that's pers uh, persistent. Um, but there's, a, there's a problems with it that I just could not really wrap my head around until I started editing the footage and, and figure out why I wasn't enjoying the game that much. So it's really pretty. I'm gonna put that out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the controls, for one, are they work fine, but it's very floaty. Yeah, everything is incredibly floaty. You feel very light, um, and it makes for some. And it feels a little sluggish too. Um, there's a lot of shit happening all the time on screen. Uh, it all blends together. Nothing really pops out or is super colorful. And the game likes to throw a lot of enemies at you all at once. Yeah, tons. So you, and there's a lot of stuff in the foreground too that help that kind of semi obstructs your view. So a lot of enemies mixed with the foreground, you kind of lose yourself in that. Uh, it becomes kind of a problem. You take a lot of damage just because you don't know what's going on and what's about to attack. Um, and one thing that I noticed that that was kind of a problem is the hitboxes are kind of off. Uh, one specific enemy is like a worm. What he'll do is he'll jump out of the ground and then he'll go into the ground. And once he enters the ground, lightning will shoot out that can hit you. Uh, and something was feeling really weird while I was fighting him. And I scrubbed through and I, I, I sent a screenshot to, to Bear. When he hits the ground, your character actually gets hit and gets sent back and gets damage done before he finishes going into the ground, before the lightning animation even happens. So you're being hit and taking damage for the lightning attack uh, before you have the visual cue that it's coming. Um, and a lot of little things like that mixed with kind of the, the, the muted palette and a lot of just clutter on the screen just makes it feel for a very messy and uh not coherent gaming experience that's where i, I kind of fell on it sure I, uh, I don't know how you feel i had a more optimistic view i actually enjoyed the time i spent with it uh i i definitely agree with you on a couple of points first of all uh the hit boxes were definitely weird and i i agree with you completely about that particular enemy as well that one in particular was was uh felt off to me while i was playing uh, but Nick mentioned this before as well. Those are the sorts of things that they have betas for. So hopefully yeah. that's the kind of thing that they're looking to address. Uh, I also agree that it is very difficult to parse out elements of the background from uh, interactable objects or even uh, hazardous objects. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, you run into these big green spiky bushes oh, that God, I, I did not notice it at all. I had no I, I idea. I never do. Yeah. And, and enemies can like walk in them yeah so you can't hit them because you just if you touch the plant it just knocks you back mm -hmm. so that would yeah oh, there's goodness. there's a couple of instances like that in the in the short time i've spent with it that were uh, a little off-putting as well uh i otherwise have basically only good things to say about it honestly i uh i i will agree that the it's floaty as well but i was able to get used to it i didn't i didn't like consider it just a straight up negative i just sort of you know assume that some games control like this like Man, Ryan, if you thought Hollow Knight was floaty, you're going to feel like you're controlling a fucking cumulonimbus cloud or something in this game, because it is... I am <laughs> writing the Nick's Weird Games theme song, <laughs> so please don't engage me in conversation right now. Which one did you choose, A or B? I chose... Uh, I think I chose A. Okay, sweet. I chose B. Oh, you chose B. All right. I chose B. All right. Uh, but yeah, so I... I do really like uh, the the art. It's gorgeous, and I love the yes, art in Yotun scary. as well. It looks incredible, and I, I uh, by that alone, I almost just want to play it to continue to see the different art pieces and the different set pieces because, man, it is very pleasing to look at. Uh, it's fun to play. I I am curious actually to see how they expand upon the uh, the combat because it's it's 
I feel it's satisfying actually to get into those encounters with a bunch of enemies at the same time and to be able to feel like you've got a semblance of control over it. There are certainly instances where you, you don't really have as much of an idea of what's going on because there's just so much because they really do overwhelm you with enemies. That's kind of the point yeah. too. It's like you'll be progressing and then all, out of nowhere like this little swarm of uh, creepy crawly critters, critters will show up and kind of overwhelm you and that's it's, it's meant to like kind of take you out of it for a second and make you focus on the immediate threat so that you aren't able to proceed. You know, like, I, I think that's by design, but it is also, uh, it does have its issues from time to time when there's just a little bit too much going on or there's just not enough to help you differentiate between different assets. So, yeah, I, I, I have similar gripes, but I, I definitely am excited about it still. I, I, I want to play more for sure. This is a lot more enjoyable for me than Yotun was as well. I don't know how much of Yotun you played. I never played Yotun. Okay, but so. like with Yotun, I I kind of had similar um, feelings about Yotun, even though they're completely different kinds of games. But with Yotun, I, I was drawn in enough by like the atmosphere and the art and uh, just, you know, the, the general sense of the game that I, I played probably like four hours, I think. And then I got to the point where I was like, ah, oh, this really isn't that fun anymore. I'm not getting enough enjoyment out of it and the art is not enough to keep me going but with this i genuinely feel like if they've got a good sense of metroidvania progression like some you know hollow knight style unlocks that we're going to get on which looking at the trailers and stuff it certainly looks like that's going to be the case i i'm still excited i'm still optimistic about it so i guess we've got we're on different sides of the fence you and i for this one but we'll see we'll see hundreds and beta. I, 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 I had a lot will. of people tell me to play it i just uh didn't if it wasn't ready yet in beta. Yeah. Um, and since it's not super far away, I figure I'll just wait for it to come out. Yeah, and, and that's probably the best route, honestly. It is uh, slated to release uh, in July, so definitely not too long to wait. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to play it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to play it. I think I'll revisit it come July when it comes out and see if uh, some of my gripes have been addressed because I do see some potential there. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Cool. Yeah, we'll see. Dope. All right, uh, then let's do the big ones. Talk about dead cells. Anybody want to start? Take it, Ryan. I think he's you still know, writing. He's still writing. What Nick. the fuck, man? <laughs> <laughs> you know right, he's got a cells. job to do. <laughs> uh, dead it. cells is the new hotness lately that everybody has gotten on the train of. Mm -hmm, it is mm -hmm. a sort of a fusion of something like Rogue Legacy meets Castlevania: Aria of Sorrow. Uh, meets throw in more game titles that fit. There's like two Hollow other Knight. ones that I had in my head. Dark Hollow Knight? Souls. Sure. Yeah, I guess it's got Estus in it. Anyway, you play a little clump of weird cells that like gets inside of this uh, ninja demon body, and then he wants to go fuck up some demons. Uh, yeah. And in the process of doing so, he earns himself some dead cells that go towards a permanent unlock system. Uh, then each time you die and start over, you end up a little bit closer to being better. Not only because it's experiential learning, but also because you've unlocked new objects that will spawn, as well as new perks and power-ups. Uh, it's got a great art style, very responsive controls, fantastic feeling to it, vibe-wise and control-wise. Uh, it can be played both fast and slow, uh, meticulously and, and rushed. Uh, whatever your play style is, there's something for everybody in this one. Yeah. Uh, Dead Cells uh, pretty much knocks it out of the park, and it's not even done yet. Yep. Man, you... You nailed it, actually. <laughs> Just that you pretty much gave it's us the back of the box. Very, right there. very good. I know it's in early access. I'm told that there's not a lot of content in the game yet. Like, it's actually pretty short. I haven't gotten to the end personally, but I, I do hear once you've gotten to the end, you realize there's not much in the game yet. Mm. Uh huh. And I hope that's, if that's true, I hope there's more coming because the oh, gameplay loop assume, is right? satisfying as hell. Yeah. I really enjoy it. And I do like, like I said, that you can feel out your particular play style and the, the game works for whatever play style you you enjoy playing most mm -hmm. did he just read a steam review no just can do that now <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's had a lot of practice i've played a few games by this point <laughs> uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and echo all that I've, I've put probably let's see i think it's like four hours now uh into dead cells and i'm still just absolutely loving it it's uh it's tough i don't know how much of a challenge you guys are experiencing with it but i have not really been oh able it's to get easy very far. it's super easy yeah, yeah, if you're no, good sure. at video games it's super easy no, <laughs> all right I'm cool yeah it's I, um, uh... it's really quite difficult <laughs> yeah i have no problems getting through the first boss once i'm past the first boss the the game amplifies its difficulty drastically really oh boy yeah there are enemies that'll one or two shot you 
shit. Just, that's that's just what they I do. I have to wonder if that's because they're front loading it for the early access point at this point, be. or if that's how it's intended to be. I know I'm sort of skeptical of this now of games. I know that they have the tendency to rebalance things for full release, uh, but it does seem like you get one shot at extremely easily in like the area like four or five. Fog Fjord and uh, Deep Prison. And, and God forbid you run into an elite when you're not oh, ready. The void. Oh, run. God, Don't, yeah. Like, you can't even outrun them. They'll teleport They'll to you chase and kill you. you down, yeah. Which is well. kind of exciting, but it's also a little frustrating. Like, the game's not perfect, but it's real close. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. if they can finish out this last little bit and make it as balanced as it needs to be, I think you're looking at, like, probably one of my favorite randomly generated action games. And there aren't a lot of those at this point that are even worth talking about. This is like a natural extension of like, what if Rogue Legacy had a badass art style? Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. this is kind of that. This and all feels... the weapons feel really cool, and the movement feels really good. Except for the whip. Fuck the whip. It's useless. What? Uh, no, oh, the whip's wrong. actually my favorite item. Oh, Dead God, wrong. It's awful. No, you're, you're, you're full what? of it. Are you talking about the electric whip or the regular Any whip? Any whip. The electric whip. No, the electric whip is good. The regular whip is bad. Okay. You're, you're the electric crazy. whip is great. You're crazy. I agree with you. The, the regular whip is, is trash garbage. The, the whip one... gets rid of all those fucking annoying flyers that you can't aim yes. at properly. Or, or you use knives Wait, for that. Or just, yeah, just have the secondary be throwing knives. Oh, well, yeah, if you get auto, that, I mean, sure. Auto attacks. Couple little points of criticism. The one thing that gets me the most right now is the fidgetiness of going over and under platforms with ladders mm -hmm. near them or chains. Uh, a lot of times I want to drop down and attack, but the character will think I want to grab onto something. Mm -hmm. And in the process of those animations going for just slightly too long, uh, you'll end up with two or three enemies all hitting you at the same time, which kind of calls a chain reaction. Uh, you want to avoid those types of moments. Anything that makes you feel out of control. And for the most part, the game does a great job of that when you're on flat land. Uh, but there are some platforming elements to it as well. They're not super severe, mm -hmm. uh, but there are a couple of tiles that I've seen generate where you'll get like this, almost like a little spike maze you've got to run through, um, or those extremely hard ground ruins that put you in a secret area that you basically die, just die. Yeah. There is like, you have 120 <laughs> seconds to kill every enemy and not be hit. And I've then only you been just able to beat die. that once. That's it. <laughs> yeah, it's I wild. think you shouldn't keep the damage that you take during the secret areas yeah, in your I'm actual run. Yeah, there. I'm kind of the curse. The curses are rough, man. Mm -hmm. I got I, a, oh I, man, I got a double stack curse the other or oh I think it was even just yesterday from like I the was, curse chests and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I had to kill curse, twenty I've consecutive learned, enemies. I got forty. Yeah. yeah. Oh god, awful. Mm -hmm. The curse chest has yet to be valuable enough to to really be worth well, it. I will say the key. I think the 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 number one tip I would give people who are going into this is really get used to using your your two sub weapons often. Yes. Just use your L trigger and R trigger. It took me a little bit to realize, like... Risk of rain style, dude. You just, yeah, all spam day, them. just spam them. Just mm -hmm. throw them around. It doesn't fucking matter. Get, like, the turret, which is great, and, like, the little biters. Those two will just tear up in a room by themselves, and you can have to stand away. And just yeah. that, was, that was the other reference I wanted to make, was Risk, risk of Rain uh, combined with Rogue Legacy with a little bit of, like, Aria of Sorrow. It's got mm. that vibe of all three of those things fused like we together. Talk about, mm. We talk about that Rogue Legacy system a lot, but there's not really a lot of games that have implemented it, like, as fully and well, I think, as Dead Cells well, has. Here. They use the emphasis on fun progression instead of punishing progression. Yeah. So putting this versus strafe, it's like the complete two diametrical opposites, right? Like strafe only wants you to suffer mm -hmm. and dead cells wants you to make some slight progression while still feeling like you did a good job, uh, even though it's still punishing and difficult. And I mean, it's such a testament to how easy and frictionless the loop is. I was just testing my stream the other day uh, uh, just to see if everything was streaming properly. I just went for one run and all of a sudden an hour went by. I didn't even have any idea that I was playing it for that long. I must have done <laughs> 10 runs. Yeah. Just end it, start it, go, and then you're just back in the game again. Yeah, and yep. it, you're right in that the the loop is so fluid and like there's no downtime whatsoever. It's just like, all right, here we go. You go, you're in it again. Yeah. It's like it's like the way that Battlegrounds is working now. That's why people are so into it. Is just because you're just you die, you queue, <laughs> you're me? good, you're going. Like that's my biggest criticism of Battlegrounds is that when you die, you've got to wait 40 minutes to play again. <laughs> what? No, the insta queue. Oh, um, I'm not aware of that. Okay. Yeah, but I, when you play with a team, you got to wait for your teammates to die. But anyway, this isn't about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was maybe a poor comparison. But anyway, uh, I, yeah, I just, I, I love it. It's it, the, uh, the, the controls are 
like you said, Nick, it takes a little bit of getting used to with the the nuance of you know like going up and down platforms and climbing and jumping uh, through platforms in particular. But beyond that, I actually feel like it's really satisfying to move around and attack and to use all the different skills. And uh, I also really like that they're a little bit more forgiving with the platforming. It seems they the the hit boxes on the spikes are not nearly as bad as i thought they were going to be when i first saw them and it's it's much easier than i expected it to be to navigate through those really perilous looking areas so i was really pleased by that too because it could have easily been like just 2d platforming hell but with a great combat game mixed into it but yeah. it's not that it is just you know sort of semi difficult platforming challenges mixed in with that action that is really the focal point my first impression when I booted up the game for the very first time was, okay, you have a double jump, but why is it the shortest double jump in the history right. of any game ever? Yeah. Until I realized it's not really that it's meant to be a double jump. It's more like a continuation of a platform that isn't there. Yeah. Uh, and if that doesn't make any sense, what I mean is when you're jumping over spikes, sometimes you just didn't make enough horizontal distance and that jump gets you out of that jam. Yeah, um, it's reasonably forgiving and it actually feels quite good. You can mm -hmm. even get runes that'll augment it, so you can get up to four jumps or maybe even more than that. Um, not that that's hugely helpful, but there are actually some hidden stuff, uh, some hidden items that require you to have a higher jump height. Um, yeah. But the game isn't largely super exploration heavy. I think it's more combat driven than anything. For sure. There are moments of exploration and there's some moments of cleverly hidden secrets, uh, which is kind of cool considering it's a randomly generated game that there's still secrets worth exploring for. Uh, but largely it's about the flow of combat and whether or not you want to rush to try and make it to the doors that close. It's got a little bit of an isaac -y thing in that too, right? Like mm -hmm. you get bonuses, there's some risk reward of like, do I want to explore the floor, get as many strength upgrades as possible, and risk missing the second world's doors being closed, or do I want to just rush it and try and get those and hope I get something along the way? Um, and plus it's got Metroidvania elements too, where after you beat certain uh, bosses, you get permanent runes, that allow you to then get to places you could never have gotten to early in the game. So even though you're making progress uh, with respect to your distance, like overall trajectory, the game actually changes slightly in the interim for the short-term gameplay as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I know you're still bobbing your head over there to the rhythm, Ryan, but I do want to hear your thoughts on it if you got a little bit more. Oh, I'm I'm done. You're good. Yeah, it's it's perfect. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> the like Dead Cells is excellent, and I would go so far as to say that as far as roguelites go, it has like the best combat of any of them. Like abstracting a little bit from that, I think it and Enter the Gungeon are like the only two games where the combat itself is actually enjoyable in a mm. vacuum. Like there's actual. Yeah. You know, there's pace and fluidity to it that yeah. doesn't exist in something like Isaac or, you know, even Rogue Legacy was very uh, floaty, I guess. I, I use that as a kind of a catch-all term, but, like, the well, combat... Was. Disconnected from the player. Yes. The combat is actually fun, and that keeps it going because it really feels like a, it's a good 2D character action game, and then the roguelite stuff is just sort of wrapped around it. Instead yeah. of it being like, the entire reason that this exists despite having shitty combat is because it's different every time. So it definitely feels like they built the game you know, from the inside out, and it's actually worked for them really well. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Uh, there we go. Anybody else got any, anything more to compliment it on? I think we've covered all the bases. The, the weapons are meaningfully different and all somewhat enjoyable in their own way. Yeah, they I also synergize that. in ways you wouldn't expect too. Uh, there are uh, there's situations where you can like do a drop in because you got like a ground pound, right? And that'll stun stuff. And then mm -hmm. you can also use a freeze right after that. Maybe throw a couple of blood knives to get them to bleed, mm -hmm. and then finish them off with the flame sword. And that's like all of those things happen in the space of one instant. Yeah, but it all feels fantastically uh, like locked together, like it's intended to be that way. You feel completely in control of those actions as well. Yeah. It's not like it's just yeah. happening to you. You're doing and, it. And each weapon has like a randomly determined uh, benefit or whatever that goes along with it as well. I had a really fun uh, run where I picked up swords that gave me double damage, but I took double the damage. Ooh. And then I took, and then I got an amulet that said enemies take as much damage as you do. So it was oh. a really good combo of like, I take double damage, but if I get hit, everything around me is going to die. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Awesome. Well, there we go. It's dead cells. More content. 
Give yes. us more. Yeah. Keep, <laughs> so, keep loading in content. I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and just read this out for those of you curious as well. It is in early access. Just entered early access last week, so it is just now starting out. Uh, but they're planning to have it in early access for about eight to twelve months. Uh, and well, yeah, that's just about it. Right now, it looks like they've got about sixteen to twenty hours of content for uh, its current state, but they're looking to improve upon that, obviously. Well, if you suck ass, you might be able to get an extra five hours. So I recommend being bad at first. Yeah. I think like the three hours I've got so far <laughs> basically encapsulate zero percent progression. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm starting to feel that way too. Uh, there we go. Dead cells. It's in early access, available right now for sixteen ninety nine. Which is an interesting price, especially when Strafe is twenty. Ah, uh, <laughs> sorry, Strafe. I wanted to like you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, that is everything, isn't it? Besides our uh, favorite segments, of course. I don't think I missed anything. Looks like we're good. Cool. Well, that will bring us into everybody's favorite segment. It's Ask Roundtable. The weekly segment where you send your questions in to roundtableyt at gmail.com. We're going to do our best to answer them. And this week's question comes from, let me say this correctly here, Helsius? It's the only way I can think to say it, Helsius. Helsius asks us, what are your opinions on full remakes and remasters versus new IPs? Are the devs wasting time making the same game experience, even if it's improved, instead of making new games with new ideas and mechanics? Uh, examples being the remastered Crash Bandicoot trilogy, uh, the new Devil May Cry, etc., things like that. Uh, and they also have a Nick's Word Games theme recommendation. Looking for any Sublime song, I gave Ryan the choice uh, between a couple earlier. Well, I'll keep it. A, I'll keep it a nice surprise for y'all in a, in a few minutes here. Uh, but uh, for now, let's focus on the question from Helsius. He asks, "What are your opinions on full remakes and remasters versus new IPs?" Anybody? Uh, Anybody? Go I on. Really, I don't really. I don't really have an issue with full remakes or remasters, uh, as long as game. There's like a, a logical reason behind it, I guess. So, mm -hmm. um, I think remastering or redoing, if it would, had been good, Halo series right before the new Halo came out to give like the newer fans, like you know, check out the new game. Um, screw it. Like the game I just actually did a review on, uh, full full throttle remastered, I think was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great. I love the ability to just press a button and go between like the new graphic style and the old graphic style and just see the difference in the, the upgrades between the, the two and how far things have come. Yeah. I love um, doing that in the Halo remaster as well. The Halo original. does the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing at all. Um, I guess it just depends on the reason. I have no issue with it. Yeah. I have no, there is a trend of them being really badly made, though, once they do the remasters. I was thinking specifically of the Silent Hill remasters that came out. Oh, that was terrible. That was really bad. So, like, if you don't have your heart in it and you don't really know what you're trying to accomplish in the whole <laughs> thing, probably do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think anyone would have been upset with a good Silent Hill 2 and 3 remaster. Did it have 4 also? I think it was just 2 and 3. No, anyway, yeah, I think it, was just doing uh, it depends on the game. It depends on the reasoning. It depends a little bit on the value that you're adding to it. Uh, for example, Full Throttle is a pretty old game. Yeah. Uh, quite a few people never would have even heard of it had it not been for that. So it's good PR uh, as well as if the remaster actually turns out good, it's kind of a win-win. Uh, yeah. But if you remake Bulletstorm and add Duke Nukem to it, <laughs> like, that, did it we is too need soon. to do that? Yeah, what was the like that that's I think a good example of like a, a bad remaster. Like <laughs> what was the point of remastering Bulletstorm for what five years? What later? was the was point five? of remastering The Last of Us two years after it came out? That to one I'm on still PlayStation 4. To put it on yeah, PlayStation that's, 4. That's really yes, but that was. one I'm still like, okay, <laughs> that's like my quintessential example of an, an unnecessary remaster. But Generally speaking, I think I'm in favor of them. I think I really enjoy I so uh, being able to uh, re-experience games that I loved in the past with an updated feel. I'm, I'm generally in favor of that. Uh, of course, you know, Master Chief Collection is going to be my go-to example, even though the release of that was totally botched. Uh, the game itself still provided me that experience and gave, gave me that little nostalgia bomb with a touch of modernization to uh, spice up the flavor. And then, uh, you know, there's there's going to be Sonic Mania coming up that I'll more than likely play the hell out of and enjoy, but it's just because it's like, it is the old Sonic games given a modern feel. And, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's also, I, I'm doubly excited for that one just because they gave, like, the Sonic fans 
the opportunity to make it and not necessarily just Sega themselves trying to re-spark the magic. It's the people that have the passion that really care about it that are doing not it. Sega. Not Sega. <laughs> not Sega. Not <laughs> Sega. No. They don't have any passion for Sonic. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, in the camp of enjoying remasters and g kind of wishing for a lot of them, honestly, like, especially like Final Fantasy VII. I know we're, we're saying that's episodic, which may or may not be a bummer, but I am pumped to play the Final Fantasy VII remake. Like, I, I'm... No, but you're not, I am. Though. Don't you dare you're tell, tell me, me you're gonna play. You're gonna play 40 hours of Final Fantasy VII remastered. I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you I'm definitely gonna play it because I want to see what they do with it. Yeah, that's like I don't know. You could like buy it and then play like two hours. Wait, I don't Maybe. get the cynicism for this one in particular. Like people loved Final Fantasy, think... now they get to have their nostalgia realized for them. It's yeah, fan service, man. Nostalgia <laughs> is like it's a, it's a trickster. It's oh, a, it is. But this time we get emotion. to have a second go at nostalgia, right? Like we get to see what was in our minds and then try and translate it back into reality. Yeah. But you already know the story of Final Fantasy VII. I, Unless they change it. I've like held the opinion for years that I would love to see a modern version of Final Fantasy VII, even though like it's I, I'm pretty sure they're going to change a lot of how the game is played because they know that nobody wants to play that game from the 90s. No, nobody wants well, to... I hope they know. They Nobody wants to spend <laughs> <might> fucking <laughs> hours getting to the Golden Saucer. They want to get there soon, you know? Like, it's... I'm well, pretty sure they're aware of the, the, the ways that the modern gamer have changed. They, they might go, but remember how much they loved watching Knights of the Round on loop because of the loop materia, so we're just going to yeah. put the 16-hour Knights of the Round animation in just as a reference. <laughs> they might say that that's a good thing they to leave in. That. You never know. I might laugh if they did that, honestly. <laughs> but uh, No, I, I just... I, I, am, I am shamelessly uh, in favor, for the most part, okay. for remasters. Although, I will say, Parappa the Rapper remastered totally blue. Because they yeah, see, they had no they reason gonna... to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, they also didn't <laughs> fix it, which is fucking ridiculous. So they didn't remaster it. They just yeah. It. They just yeah. They pretty much just re-released it. Really. Uh, other thoughts? Uh, uh, yeah. The Last Guardian should get a remaster. <laughs> I mean, I know that's what like six months old, but like it yeah. really could have been a lot better. <laughs> and this is a game that I, I'm looking forward to actually playing in ten years when it's good. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they should have just fucking canceled it. No, they sh the, they should have cut it in half <laughs> and made it PS4 Pro exclusive, I guess, because it's the only fucking machine that can handle the damn thing. Remember every time it came up, we were like, it's only going to be like a five-hour experience and it'll be done. That's what I great. wanted, man, and it was fucking 12 of <laughs> yeah, the same shit. That's what I wanted, too. Uh, you know, the thing is, they were screwed in either direction. About the last guardian. Yeah, we don't, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, can we talk about No Man's Sky? Oh, hey, yeah, we haven't gotten to that in a while. What are they up to? Now you got me actually genuinely curious. How's that game doing these Any days? Any Hello Games tweets? No, no, no. They retweet things every now and again. All right, well, they exist again. That's a start. Yeah, that's good. Anyway, there we go. Helsius, thank you for the question. If you've got a question for us, feel free to send it over to roundtableyt at gmail.com. That'll bring us in everybody's favorite segment after their favorite segment. It's time for <clears throat> Nick's Weird Games. This is going to be a Nick's Weird Game to the tune of um, What I Got by Sublime. Yep. Yep. Can I get... First, there's two things to keep in note here. One is there's like a 17-second guitar break. Between but do, the do, first... do, 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 do. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so keep that in mind. I've that one a few times. Because uh, I've got like a karaoke backing track here. The other thing is, can I get the... Can I get like the first note? Can I get a bass note, a tracking note? You know, it's early in the morning, mm -hmm. something like that. You just want That's me to it. hit you with that right here? Pretty good. I want, I want the note. Early in the morning. Early in the morning. Something like that? Yeah. Okay. Then in the chorus, though, it goes higher. So it's going to get lost a little bit. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Give me a second here. I got the karaoke track in the background. Mm hmm Early in the morning. Okay. I got it. I got it. Go. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Later in the podcast, time for a tonal change. Better make sure to close your chat, because it's time for Nick's Weird Games. <laughs> Got to find the game that Nick is hinting to you. 
You can bet your ass that it ain't on the Ouya. <laughs> I've got a PlayStation. I can be Doom Guy. But I don't know RPGs from 2000 fucking five. <laughs> well, next games, they aren't super hot. So pay attention, son, or your ass will get got. Never is Persona, never Toka Den. If you think it's Jersey Devil, then you better guess again. Make a small example. Here's a tip from me, Wrecking Brain, full C pluses that came on PS3. Games are what I got. Some of them are neat, but games from Nick's shelf tend to be sheet. It all looks like a chat devil dice survivor. Try to guess that. You're bound to get swerved. Nick's games are hard, unless you're quite smart. And you remember Dragon Guard. Nick's games are pretty weird. I said, remember that. Nick's games a pretty weird uh, i said remember that uh, okay that's oh my god uh, dude <laughs> wow as always how does it keep Impressive. getting better god he's getting the it. time to prep he does yeah. yeah he's taking more and more time out of like the last quarter of the show here. production <laughs> value is just skyrocketing at this point. Right? it really is thank you thank you all right hey it's nick's weird games everybody uh, every week nick's gonna get a weird game from his catalog of very many weird games we're gonna try to guess what it is <laughs> I say soon when I run out of games, we just end it with a song. Just have them do a song. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's fine. <laughs> I think everybody like that better. Uh, all right. So I got another weird game for you. Yeah. Believe it or not. Here we go. Uh, this one's pretty easy, though. I think you'll probably end up getting it pretty sure anyway. Uh, so I'm going to try and give you a, a very obtuse hints at first, okay. just so it's not a giveaway. Mm -hmm. uh, so our developer today is Sandlot. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever heard of them, you might already know the answer. Yeah, you know what? I'm starting to turn the gears already. Hold on. All right, turn Sorry, them away. Who is uh, it? Sandlot, Sandlot, like Sandlot. the little okay, baseball yeah. kid yeah. movie. Mm -hmm. uh, this is we're talking about a 360 game. It's actually the third one in the series, but the only one or the first one to be released in North America. Uh, so Japan had had it a couple of iterations before we got the the very first one. It was released on 360 and later on PlayStation Vita. And it spawned two additional sequels from it. Uh, what we're talking about today is an action shooter game. Uh, it was released in North America in 2007 and then followed up on Vita in 2013. So there's a very big gap between the two. Uh, third person shooter, kind of focused on huge amounts of weaponry. And totally so you have to choose my words was. very carefully here because if I say even one wrong word, you're going to get it immediately. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to segue to the game takes place across 53 levels featuring destructible environments taking place in such settings as cities and underground caves. Is there is no it penalty a for collateral damage. Red faction game. No. Sounds like it, though. It's 360. It's the first one we got. Sounds like mercenaries. Uh, the game was generally received like with middling reviews, but then a few people loved it and thought it was inexplicably fun. That does sound wow. like mercenaries. But, uh, yeah. Uh, it's not mercenary. Some outlets, however, claim the game pales in comparison to its predecessor, which had a larger range of enemies, missions, and weapons, and a second playable character. Chat certainly knows what it is. Chat's got we it. Get a little bit more than just a, like, I feel I'm like... trying to find the right words that aren't just dead giveaways. <laughs> is there uh, a proprietary skill and the skill is also the name of the game? No. Is it is... game name like takedown or something? No. Whiplash. Is... Are you what are you fighting? I feel like I'm on the right track. You're fighting a range of things, uh aliens essentially. Aliens? Okay. Uh destructible terrain. Early, you said early to mid 2000s like 2007 06? in north Seven? america i feel like i play i feel oh, like I, um, I brought this out I, I feel like i brought this out of gamestop is it uh earth defense yeah Force? yeah it's earth defense force you're yeah, fighting ants and shit hey, yeah nice yeah, yeah yeah i'll give it to you regardless that you didn't get the year it's not even 20 it's uh, 2017 yeah. yeah earth defense oh, force 2017. i saw that and i was like wait that's now yeah i played that game it's that time game, that game was <laughs> actually i think that game is bad but i think it's fun <laughs> I think it's like a bad. Fun. That sounds like There's what the reviews say. There's a version of it say. on PC now, you know. The when is you say really? when you yeah, say yeah, yeah, there was like a couple years ago. You're right. 
I hear them say it's inexplicably fun, and that makes me think, like, you're playing the game, and you're like, wow, I shouldn't be enjoying this, but I yeah. definitely am. That's kind of the sentiment I got from reading the reviews as well. Yeah. Uh, they felt like yes. they shouldn't be enjoying this, but are anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a mindless shooter with tons of weaponry and, you know, silly aliens. I think it's sort of like a Godzilla approach to things. Mm. The buildings were very 2007 destructible, <laughs> where uh -huh. they, like, <laughs> weird hunks would just kind of, like, fall off. Yeah. Yeah, it's not always bad if it's a silly game. Oh, it just seems yeah. like this was. It's super silly. That, that was very uh, Red Faction, too, the way that the yeah. buildings would all collapse like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it looks like a lot of people got this one in chat. The first one I see before it scrolled away was CDR Rainbow, so congrats to you. Nice job. Well done. Good shit. Well, hey, everybody. You did it again. You made it through. Sam, we did it. We set up a gauntlet for you, and you, you crushed it. Well done. We're so proud of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching the show. Thank you for supporting us here doing this goofy little podcast. We appreciate you a lot. Uh, we are here live every single Friday from uh, about 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock Pacific here on twitch.tv slash Podcast. If you ever wanted to watch the show live, that's where you follow and you get notified when we go live there. You can also follow us on Twitter at RoundtablePC. You can uh, catch the show discussion over on our subreddit, roundtablepodcast.reddit.com. You can, of course, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Leave us a review is there as well. It does still help us out a little bit. And, uh, of course, we want to send a big, fat thank you to our Patreon supporters over on patreon.com slash roundtable. Thank you very much to Julian Avelsgaard, Jonathan Graham, Scratty119, Ricky Greist, John Kalchik, O Thomas Games BR, Jakar Sampson with a dance number, Sehoa, Kolnar, Jamie Tinsley, Joseph Boss, Pangelette, Michael Bush Larson, Talks to Wall, TJ Majesty, Chaos, You Know the Rules, and So Do I, Theorist. Beautiful. Colby Klein, Greenlight, Oren Saltzman, Christopher Flagg, Eric Schooley, Brizzle Brip, Positron, Myth Scarab, Mediocrities, Justin Samurfett, and Logan Ray. Thank you all very, very much for Thank continuing. Thank you very much to support the show that means a lot we are back over a thousand over there on the patreon as well so thank you guys for Yay. for keeping that yeah. up that means a Thanks, lot guys mm -hmm. and uh that'll do it i'm actually Thanks everybody be... that subscribed also yeah appreciate it very much thank you very much to all the subscribers thank as you. well thank you thank you for supporting the show that way too it means a lot you can uh watch the vod here on twitch if you're a subscriber with the uh, vod there you can also watch it for free over on our youtube channels that is usually uploaded uh a a couple hours later on my channel, and then the next day over on Rockley Smile and Mathis Games as well. And I believe, I believe that covers it, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And tonight, actually, uh, if you're interested, you can go watch me. I'll be doing a charity live stream over on twitch.tv slash prescription pixel. Uh, she's raising money for her new Checkpoint video series uh, tying games with mental health. So I'm going to be doing that uh, and hosting that here and uh, on the Bear Taffy channel as well. So if you want to go watch and maybe support that, that'd be cool too. But uh, that'll do it for us today. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Later. Bye, everybody. Bye. Oh, where's the song, though? He doesn't have the song ready. There it is. You gotta get the stream there deck, it is. man. All right. I got it. I got it. <laughs>